Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting, scheduled for Monday, September 13th, 2021, at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel? Present. Ms. Cassell? Here. Mr. Bolston? Present. Ms. Johnson? Present. Mayor Petrolia? Here. We could all stand for the pledge. So we're at agenda approval. Anyone have any changes, deletions, recommendations? I, I, was, I was wondering if maybe we could do the resolutions, if there was anyone here to have them. They, they're, I don't know the resolutions. Resolutions, I'm sorry. The, the, the ones that you've been taking pictures for, I don't know if we want to discuss them or no. The ones, proclamations, I'm sorry, proclamations. Proclamations. Oh, okay. Um, we, did the, um, we're, we, there's no proclamations gonna, they're just part of the record, but we're not uh, gonna be reading any into the record today. So Let's everybody came earlier and got the pictures. If anybody wants to speak um, about a proclamation, you'll step up during the co public comment section, if that's okay. Very Anyone good. else? Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. All right, moving on to the presentations. We're starting off with uh, uh, an administrative employee of the month. And this Sandra. Good afternoon, everyone. Good Assistant afternoon. Um, HR Generalist Sandra Cordova. Uh, Mayor and Commissioners, I have a wonderful and amazing employee of the month. Um, it gives me great honor to welcome um, and honor Jesse Houston, our Administrative Assistant in Human Resources. He has earned Employee of the Month and our Human Resources, Human Resources Generalist Ebony Olivier is gonna tell you what he did to earn this honor. Jesse Houston started with the city of Dari Beach as a Delray Beach shadow. Uh, but nobody knows that a few weeks before our annual shadow day event, I met Jesse. Jesse was a recent graduate. He graduated May of 2018 from FAU. And in November of 2018, Jesse came to see me. A former classmate of Jesse's, who was an intern and now a full-time employee at the city, told him about our Human Resources Next Generation Initiative, where we help bridge the gap, the generational gap, and encourage college students and or recent graduates to consider a career in local government. At that time, Jesse was working part-time for the city of Boca Raton's Parks and Recreation Department, but he had an interest in the human resources field. I told Jesse about a shadow program that we started at the, at that time. We only had that program for two years. And uh, Delray Shadow Day, I explained to Jesse that um, it was where you can shadow in your field of your interest. I gave him information about our shadow program and advised him to shadow the city of Boca's HR department since he was working there part time. Jesse ended up participating in our shadow program, and at the end of our shadow program, he was offered to volunteer um, at the HR department for the city of Delray Beach. As a volunteer, Jesse proved that he was an asset to our department. Um, Jesse streamlined a lot of our processes and turned our HR forms into fillable friendly PDFs. Soon after a full-time position became available with the Human Resources Department, Jesse applied and got the job. Jesse assisted with our internship program, implemented a lot of ideas to make the program more impactful. He hosted a lunch and learn and how to set up SMART goals, and he really connected with the interns about life after graduation. The first thing that Jesse tackled as a full-time employee was bringing our department processes and forms into the 21st century. Jesse has a gift of innovation, efficiency, and effectiveness. 
During his first year as a full-time employee, Jesse received his HR certification through the Society of Human Resource Management. Jesse studied for the test and passed it on his first try. During this time at the city of Delray Beach, Jesse also implemented a paperless process that cut the city's paper consumption by 5%. Jesse implemented a way to electronically document all employee change activity. Jesse continues to be an asset to the HR department and the city of Delray Beach as a whole. So recently, I asked Jesse if he ever took my advice and asked the city of Boca if he could shadow their HR department, and Jesse replied no. He said the first day he walked into the city of Delray Beach, he knew that he found his family, and the city of Delray Beach is now where he calls home. Boca loss was definitely our gain. Thank you, Jesse, for all of your hard work. Nice. Wow, thank you so much for that wonderful recognition. Um, I, I've truly um, really created a family here uh, with everybody in, in uh, the city and in HR. I remember uh, working on a project where we uh, created a welcome video that we show at orientation, every orientation. And everyone said it was the people that made the difference here. And I can honestly say it is true. So I want to say thank you again to everybody and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. So Jesse, on behalf of the city of Delray Beach, we'd like to present you with the Employee of the Month Award. Oh. And you get Eight hours of time Eight off with pay. Woo! Thank you, Jesse, for uh, selecting uh, Delray Beach to call your home and especially for uh, your employment. We so appreciate you being here. and. We love when the youth come in and show us how to do things uh, more efficient, better, and obviously you've you've handled that for us. And for anybody out there that uh, doesn't know, we've got a great shadow program. We also have a great intern program here in Delray Beach, and we get a lot of our uh, future employees just that way. And it really kind of keeps us on the cutting edge of some of these uh, things that these guys know better than us that have a, are a little longer in the tooth. How about that? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, Sam, you're up. All right. Sam's got a stack of plaques. I know, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Sam Mita, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to present a little recognition to uh, one of the really important key members of our staff, and that is our cemetery management crew. Um, we have a small staff over at the Municipal Cemetery that, like many people over the last 18 months, it's been a very big challenge. Um, this team has, as you can imagine, a very delicate situation, um, handling a number of people in a, in a very troubling time. Um, over the last 18 months, we have almost a 60% increase in the number of burials than we do on an annual basis. So you can imagine what kind of extra volume that takes from this staff. Um, much, much busier weekends, many more grieving families. Um, and this team has stepped up. They've worked long hours. They've worked um, days off and and a lot of extras that go into situations that we all we all have been challenged with such as only telling a family they can only have 10 people at the funeral um, that was a challenging time for us and and this team was the front line for that um, they're also responsible for the maintenance of the cemetery which not only did they maintain during this time they've actually improved the grounds on a considerable basis so um, Without going further, we're very proud of this team, and I thank you once again for this moment, just so we can offer individual recognition to them for the, the extra above and beyond work they've done. So, thank you. First and foremost, uh, we have Chad Sweat. Thank you, guys. Next up is Curtis Wise. Curtis? We have John Poppy. John Poppy is our crew manager out here at the cemetery. Thank you. 
And unfortunately, um, our cemetery manager, Yasmin Kakar, uh, she deserves this recognition, so I'll make sure I read her name in. But she had to leave town to do her own personal um, loss this weekend, so I apologize that she's not right. here. But um, she deserves this award, and we will make sure she gets this. So thank you. Sorry to hear about that. And um, I, I noticed everybody put their arm around you, so that's that's kind of really nice. Yeah, I think it's the height difference. <laughs> 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 that's not what you should have said. But anyway, um, I have to say this, Sam. The, the the cemetery has never looked as 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 beautiful. I mean, the, you've really done a great job of working on it. The uh, fencing. I'm loving that you're putting the pictures up so people can see what has been done. The landscaping. Um, the way that it's being kept up. And in addition to that, we were down to, I want to say, what, a couple of burial plots, four. Mm -hmm. And we have increased that um, by a tremendous number. So we actually have some more spots avail uh, plots available. Um, and uh, and I just want to also tell everybody, my, my son was one of those out there that was actually finding out where all the he was pushing he was doing a volunteer work uh, one summer. And I thought that was a while. I said, for your life, you'll never. You'll, you'll always be able to say that you had the most odd job, which was to find out where the corners of the caskets were in the, in the ground. I said, That's you can always use that. Absolutely. But anyway, thank you for everything. It looks, it looks absolutely beautiful, and thank we appreciate you. that. So, so important. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, did he? The first one. Oh. Okay, Check. let's get one. Sorry. Come on back in. There we go. All right, Sam, you've got uh, 4C also, right? I'm right back. Yeah. All right, very good. All right, our next item is a little brighter. Um, I, again, thank you for this opportunity to recognize um, our Delray Beach Tennis Center. Um, those of you that have not heard, we were just awarded one of the top 25 uh, outstanding facilities um, for the Delray Beach Tennis Center. Um, we, we have a press release here from the USTA, and the USTA says, um, the executive chief, Craig Morris, said, the Delray Beach Tennis Center has embraced many key tennis initiatives and kept the sport at the forefront of its community each year. The Delray Beach Tennis Center has a unique downtown location that enables easy access to hotels, restaurants, and shopping that help promote the city's sporting events and sports tourism. They are the host site for the annual ATP Champions Tour and the Delray Beach Open, as well as the home court training facility for a number of professional players like our own hometown Coca Golf and past tournament champion Francis Tiafo. The Delray Beach Tennis Center has a strong community relationship and works well with disadvantaged youth and the non-for-profit organizations in our town. So with that, we've invited the, um, our partners here with the management of the Tennis Center and I offer them our congratulations and our thanks and I'd like to present them and us the 21 Outstanding Facility Award. Very nice. On, on behalf of the tennis partner, there is Sharon Painter, our head tennis uh, Je director of tennis, Jeff Bingo, and her team. Very good. Thank you so much. Did you want to say a few things, oh. Sharon? Yes, I always have something to say. Uh, I'd like to thank the mayor and the commissioners and the Parks and Recreation Department for all their support. And we have some of our team members here. It, this is a team award and a city award. So thank you thank for your you. assistance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and by the way, uh, Fight Central too. <laughs> I understand. It was a fun time. I bet it was. Unfortunately, I was out of town. Thank you again for Thank your time. Thank you so much. All right. So now we're gonna have purchasing. Let these guys get out. Here we go. And Ms. Jennifer Alvarez, long time no see. Yeah. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Commissioners, City Manager, Madam Attorney. Um, I'm Jennifer Alvarez, Director of Purchasing here for the City. And I'm here um, on behalf of our Purchasing Department to announce that for the third consecutive time in the City's history, the City of Delray Beach has been awarded the prestigious Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award from the National Procurement Institute. The AEP award, as it's called, is earned by public and nonprofit agencies that demonstrate a commitment to procurement excellence. The award recognizes organizations that embrace innovation, professionalism, productivity, leadership, and e-procurement. And as procurement leaders, 
what we understand to be our primary responsibility is to be stewards of public dollars and of the public trust. And that, um, quite frankly, is the best part of winning this award, knowing that the city is sending the message to the community that ethical and certified professionals are dedicated to fair and open competition and that they're bringing value to our city and to our community. And so I'd like to basically recognize two members of our team that are here this evening. And we have Ms. Yolena Ruiz in the far corner. And the newest member of our team, Mr. Chris Snyder, is with us. We have three uh, members of our team that are not able to be here, um, but I'd like to recognize Alex Sanderson, Janelle, J Janelle McAdden, and Elise Treisman. And that's really the end of my presentation. I should have done like Sam did and make sure I got my award first, <laughs> but it's really big and heavy, so I don't know. My, maybe it was a better award. So anyways, thank you so much to, our, to the commission and everybody at the dais, because without your support, we wouldn't be able to achieve what we do. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thanks for doing an excellent job and bringing the award home. We appreciate it. You guys have done a, an outstanding job, obviously, by getting this a third consecutive award of this type. So uh, kudos to everybody in your uh, department for achieving this. Thank you very much. Sandy. All right, Ms. Julia. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commission, and everyone at the dais. Let me just check. Uh, is there a, is that, okay, thank you. Uh, Julia Davidian, um, I'm here to uh, do a presentation related to a report that you have um, on the agenda today, one of two. Let me see, oh, jumped real quick, hold on. Um, so to um, kind of close the loop on the update that I provided to you last month, the uh, report on the lease compliance for Old School Square was completed. Um, it is included as an attachment, and you, you've received that last week. Uh, so I just wanted to take a few minutes to um, highlight uh, some of the key elements. Uh, you have the objective there was to assess and, and look to see whether the uh, reporting commitments as outlined in the lease were, uh, were met. Um, and the conclusion is that um, um, in the aggregate, Looking collectively at all of the commitments, say uh, Old School Square was not in compliance with Article 6.1 of the lease. Uh, the appendix to the report goes um, one by one, each, each commitment, and provides you the detailed um, analysis and, and the results for each one of the items. And I've also added some recommendations to enhance financial record keeping and reporting transparency. Um, in regards to the uh, budget files and some of the financial reports in lieu of audited finances that were available and some of the elements that I couldn't see or were somewhat at odds to get, get, give some suggestions of things that definitely can be looked at. Okay, hold on. So again, back to perhaps a chart that you may have seen in the last meeting, just um, here providing to you uh, the, the complete review results. Um, the first com uh, commitment was related to the strategic plan, and unfortunately that um, commitment is not deemed to be in compliance. Uh, the files that uh, were received and reviewed would not be what, what is considered a strategic plan. There were presentations and and some SWOT analyses, but not uh, something that you can take and, and see as measurable goals um, and elements that then can be tracked, updated annually. And as you'll see in a later commitment, one of the requirements of the lease was on a semi-annual basis to go back and report back to the city to say, how did we do on some of these strategic plan items? Did we meet them or not? So um, given what was provided uh, by the COO so far, um, at this point, there wasn't ability for me to conclude that this was in compliance. And um, in addition, I also reviewed files that were available at the CRA uh, servers. Um, after the meeting last time, there were really no additional uh, responses from Old School Square, even though I attempted to, to follow up. Um, so I really went back to see, was there anything else that the CRA may have had from prior applications to supplement that? So that was really the only other elements reviewed uh, for, for this um, Excuse report. Me. Could I just um, clarify? 
You got the stock of stack of documents, which at the last meeting in the aftermath, uh, the indication was everything needed for compliance was in that stack of documents. But you've since gone through all that. Yes. And discovered that, in fact, there is still no compliance, notwithstanding those submissions. Correct. So okay. in addition to everything that was submitted, I continued the follow up after the meeting. So on August 11th, I still sent emails. Okay. I have not received response to them. I believe on the 12th, we received an attorney email. So since then, all communication ceased. So all I did after the fact was to go to the CRA and say, can I see if you have any former applications that may have some of the files that I still so You were still identify. trying to get them in compliance, notwithstanding the fact that they weren't communicating with you. Correct. OK, thank you very much. The second item relates to the annual budget. Um, now, the issue here with the budget files is that they are predominantly geared towards the funding received from the CRA. So they do not give you a complete picture of the organization as a whole. Uh, which my interpretation is that what the lease would be looking for. For instance, if we looked at the budget file for you know, the most recent fiscal year, none of the items related to uh, the capital improvement, the Crest Theater, or the gift that was provided by the donor were listed there. So you don't see um, you know, sort of an, an inflow and outflow items identified related to um, those uh, ongoing projects. So uh, the budget itself, that document, really is intended to serve the CRA funding purpose. It highlights narrative and information just for that subset, not for the organization as a whole. So uh, it is not deemed to be uh, in compliance as well. The annual audit report, including management letters, uh, the most recent audit is still ongoing, so that year, for that year, we do not have the report finalized. Uh, prior periods would be in compliance. Those audited financials have been issued. Uh, with the IRS Form 990 and 990T, uh, the most recent one has not uh, been filed, so the current period, even though it should have been already filed, and the extension um, deadline has passed as well, um, were not filed. And for the 1819 fiscal year, the Form 990T has not been filed as well. Uh, now, there wouldn't be a, a payment liability there, but it is a requirement to file it. And um, the uh, 2018 Form 990 itself has documented in the notes there that this would be done later on. Um, Commitment number, uh, commitment D, um, with that one, I was able to, again, find everything needed either from the CRA records or what all school square provided, so that commitment is in compliance. It says for the current period through Q3, because, again, this is an ongoing quarterly reporting that can be substituted for this item of the lease with CRA reports, and that takes me to the next slide. Um, item E relates to statements um, and policies that need to be in place in the efforts to improve diversity of the board and pro programs offered. Uh, so we received the policy that was uh, put together in a very recent uh, board meeting and information that would have supported fiscal 20 and 21, but this is a requirement that is forward-looking in a sense. So at the time that we are now um, um, you know, talking right now, we have already a new fiscal year coming up, and we don't have an update for that year plans, as well as nothing prior to 2021 uh, fiscal. So it was really um, the documentation received met only one of those reporting periods. Um, commitment F, written statement regarding collaboration with other organizations and entities within the city. Uh, so for this item, all that was provided were just listings of names of organizations uh, within the city. So to me, this is not providing what the lease requirement is, which is to explain and have that statement that describes how the cooperation and collaboration takes place. So for prior periods, this is not deemed met, but the current reporting period would only be due at the end of this year. So that can be uh, you know, provided and reviewed as, as needed. Uh, the last item, semi-annual report. So um, this was a very comprehensive commitment that had several elements. Um, and as the notes in the report suggest, 
perhaps items one, two, and three would have been captured by CRA reporting that was provided in item D. Um, however, the very last one, um, item number four there, ties again with those goals and objectives that start from the strategic plan. So if we do not have a strategic plan that highlights these, you also cannot then go back and report on that. And those reports were yeah, you know, not provided at all. Um, everything that was CRA related um, was the thought process that it covered it. But um, again, reviewing that also with um, um, the city attorney, the actual definition of what this commitment is, um, it doesn't say in the least that any of that can be substituted with CRA reporting. So these are the highlights of the sections of the lease that were reviewed, and um, as I said in the report, you have you know, the details of, of each item. Question. Uh, on the prior slide, I believe you said they are also not in compliance with IRS reporting requirements in terms of their 990-990-T forms? That is correct. Thank you. And does that um, potentially risk their designation as a nonprofit? You know? So I believe if they don't file for three consecutive years, they may lose it. So there was a filing for the fiscal 1819 uh, for the 990 itself. Um, the the one that's fiscal 1920 is the one that hasn't been filed yet. So you're you're not looking at, at losing designation, no. Okay. But thanks. there are um, obviously late filing penalties that could be assessed by the IRS and there could be a request to waive them, but you know, I would not know how that was handled by whoever okay. filed their return. Thanks. Um, so you noted that in the 2021-22 uh, combined budget file and quarterly reports, they did not account for major ongoing capital improvements, um, but you note that previously they would account for that. So as in prior budget cycles, capital improvements expenses were listed as line items. Right. So in, in much older reports, I would say probably from you know three years ago, there would be a line item called capital improvements, but there wasn't anything there provided related to well, we know the we museum or anything else that was done. Uh, so when I asked about the most recent one, um, I was advised that there is a separate construction budget. Now, it is possible that there is a separate CIP budget as opposed to including it in the operating, but we haven't been provided with that. So they, they said it was in a separate budget, but Correct. didn't provide the budget to you. Okay, thank you. And then, um, sorry, just give me a second. You say that... Uh, the 2021-22 combined budget file and quarterly budget to actual reports appear present to be incomplete or inaccurate. The year-to-date expense data pertaining to payroll. Uh, right. So when I was looking at the most recent budget file as well as the quarterly that show actuals to, to a certain date as of the reporting timeline there. And these are, again, reports that are provided to the CRA. Um, so I noticed, noted some instances where the numbers didn't, um, they, they appeared at odds. Uh, for instance, two periods appear to have the same exact payroll expense, which would be unreasonable if we're looking at March 31st and then May 31st. Right. Um, so uh, that also was uh, at odds with a different internal report from their general ledger that listed a different number. Interesting. Um, so for that reason, I said that it would be recommended to review these um, for you know, consistency and completeness. And when, again, you're making these recommendations, but nothing came back to you that made those changes or amended those documents, correct? Uh, so again, I continued my review since um, the uh, meeting last time when I came in front of you mm -hmm. and, and provided an update. Um, so at that point, I've received a lot of these quarterly files that included the budget numbers. By that time when I presented, all I had was just a one budget file for fiscal 21 and 22. So I certainly continued the work after that meeting, and um, I had no other way to ask those questions because communication stopped after the 11th. So I am simply highlighting some items from the very recent file, which I think can certainly be 
uh, corrected and, and right. updated if needed or clarified, but these were the only files available and there was really no no point on continuing to hold this Understood. audit under the sure. May I jump in just real quick? I just want to ask it to clear, for clarification. Um, you said a couple of times that um, communication was halted. At our choice because of the fact that we received that letter from the legal, legal or was it um, you had continued to try to reach out and there was no response? I'm just trying to understand. So I sent two emails, I believe, on August 11th. I haven't received a response back. They were not specific to a budget. They were on Form 990 and some other elements, I believe. And then on the 12th, I think that email came, and that was my understanding with uh, checking with the city attorney that I should not be reaching Very good. out Thank further. you. Sorry. Sorry to no, interrupt. No. Thank you. Um, the PPP. Um, you made a note that they may have inadvertently double dipped their payroll expenses incurred or used the PPP loan funding for other purposes in excess of the percentage designated by the SBA. Could you explain that? Uh, sure. So. As I was reviewing the files that were provided to the CRA, um, in, in those folders there was discussion of a recent PPP loan during 2020 that was uh, received by Old School Square. It was later on forgiven. So the loan was forgiven in uh, this year in 2021. Um, so that was an item that, again, I would have looked to see whether it was mentioned in the budget file as, again, other source of income, non-taxable, if it shows budget to actual from a pri prior year and it wasn't there. Um, and there were additional reports that on the quarterly basis when they're provided to the CRA outline how is the quarterly CRA funding being spent on what programs or on what line items. So what caught my eye was that I see that Old School Square is reporting to the CRA we use let's say 97,000 of the funding you gave us towards payroll well, if payroll was already fairly low because all staff was furloughed except a um, handful, I believe seven, um, those numbers didn't add up how they would have reached the minimum 60% required of the PPP loan to be used towards payroll. So in other words, the PPP loan had to be used within a 24-week period max from the time it was um, you know, funded. and portion of it could have been used towards various business running related right. expenses, but 60% of it had to be used towards payroll. And from what I see in those two quarters as reported in those budget reports, so again, I'm, I'm saying I, I don't know for sure because I'm going based on that information of what was the actual expense. If you subtract from that what CRA paid and funded, what you're left with, which is truly the payroll expense then to be covered, by a PPP, I don't see how that adds up to that 60% minimum. So what this may present based on this information is this, um, this concern of double dipping. So when the same expense is uh, reimbursed by two separate funding sources. Um, again, I only pointed that out because it was an item that was questioned in, in one of the um, I think the meetings that I uh, reviewed the minutes from the um, CRA to understand what other elements might be present in that budget or financial reports, and, and I wanted to point that out to see if we could, again, get some additional clarification on, on that element. And that, uh, once they were reimbursed, that liability never came off the financial information that you had received, correct? The liability did come off. Uh, there was a new PPP loan that was received that I didn't see being added as a liability as of the date of that other uh, financial statement. That and was, was the second PPP received after the individuals were furloughed? I believe so. I, I yeah. don't know how many exactly came back, but it does not appear that all were rehired. They were at, at two different um, years. I have a question about the PPP before you move on, just uh -huh. so I can understand. Um, PPP loans are for specifically for um, salaries, not for benefits. Is that correct? So, in other words, does if if there was benefits, let's say that were being paid for those that were furloughed, not salary. If you're furloughed, you're not getting the salary. 
Um, would that have made up a difference, or is it really for just salaries? The, the numbers include payroll ex related Both? taxes, okay. fringes. And yes. It still didn't meet that. Correct. I got you. Thank you. Again, based on the numbers that were yes. reported. No, I understand. So if those were incomplete or did not provide some additional element of payroll, um, this, this could be a moot point, but um, it was just the same concern related to the fact that in some of the budget to actuals, payroll numbers just didn't change from one period to another. Another report showed a different total, and then um, simply the identification of the forgiven loan, which then becomes other non-taxable income, was just not uh, presented as, as a source of funding and um, certainly a, an item that the CRA would have been interested in, in knowing about. Thank you. Anything else, Commissioner? No. Thank you. Anyone Thank else you for your time. I appreciate the report. Thank you. Dr. Devine, I always screw your name up. <laughs> Julia. Thank you so much for a very thorough, professional um, audit. And I understand that you're limited as to what you could uh, come up with and tell us because of the cutoff of communications, not on our side. You reached out several times from what I can understand, but there was no response. I would um, hope that the CRA commissioners are listening, and if there are funds in the amount of 100 and $87,500 that they received in the 2020-2021 20, uh, 20, 20, uh, allocation that a serious look at what was going on with that uh, allocation, that action would be taken if um, there are funds that should not have been distributed in lieu of the fact that they were also getting a PPP, I don't know, using the same uh, formula and uh, I don't know if we're gonna find anything, but I would hopeful, hopeful, be hopeful that if there were any taxpayer funds that were expended, that we would be able to retrieve those. As um, Ms. Um, Alvarez just said, we are stewards of the public dollars and the public, public trust, and if for no other reason, this should be something that is taken into account because it is taxpayer dollars. Thank you very much for a wonderful professional job. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. First, Shana Tovar, good to see you. Thank you. Um, I have a question you may not be able to answer, maybe Lynn or Mr. Moore. We have other nonprofits uh, renting uh, city spaces, uh, Arts Garage, off the top of my head, maybe the uh, Chamber of Commerce, maybe some others. Can you identify any other of these nonprofits that have these strict requirements and this list of requirements that Old School Square uh, had in their lease? I would not be able to. Um, the scope and the objective assigned was review of this lease. So certainly if the commission has any other requests. No, I'm not making a request and that's why I thought okay. you know, my two friends over here may have a better answer. <laughs> So as, as you recall, the Arts Garage recently came before you and amended their lease agreement, and they had very stringent um, requirements as well. And I think that um, I think the conversation was that because of their performance and you know what um, Ms. Waldo had done with the organization, that you felt comfortable relieving a lot of those um, requirements from their lease, and they have a straight lease. And just it's okay. I'm sorry. Just to add, ladies and gentlemen, I personally had a visit with Ms. Marjorie Waldo this past Thursday over at the Art Garage facility to essentially confirm what Lynn just talked about in her comments and to understand and learn the scope of the agreement. And thus, I think we're pretty squared away in that regard. So I had a good experience and a good visit and a good orientation. So I guess the answer is no. No other nonprofits have these strict, strenuous requirements. These, the smaller nonprofits, like the Historical Society, Spady, they have lesser requirements because I don't think their budgets can support a full-blown audit and they don't receive the taxpayer funds that um, Old School Square and Arts Garage received. So I think um, they have, I forget what the name of it, but it's a, it's a smaller version of an audit that they have to prepare. Uh, you are correct. I mean, th this lease is... Old well, School Square is unique in this regard for the reasons noted. May I just ask a question, though? It seems what you're saying is previously Old School Square and the Arts Garage had more or less the same reporting requirements, but we feel comfortable with the reporting thus far from the uh, from Miss Waldo, and we've amended the lease accordingly. 
but there was a time where they were both had the same reporting requirements. So yes, that's I, different I than nobody having them. That's we've earned our way into a better situation. And I think Arts Garage paid somewhere close to maybe ten thousand dollars. I don't know if it's a month or a year. They had to pay actual rent. They did as well as Correct. all the reporting requirements. versus getting the dollar rent. Correct. So and I, that's a different situation. Well, I don't know if it's different, but. Uh, I appreciate the answer to the question. The other thing, if it could be done, is this is the first time I'm seeing uh, your presentation, and I think it's probably going to show it to me at the meeting we have scheduled mm -hmm. for tomorrow because I was out of town. But if this could be updated to the um, agenda, because I noticed that it wasn't uploaded, so just for the public to be able to, to review your findings. Sure. Absolutely. Thank and you. It's, it's all from the report itself, so there's nothing new on on the presentation that's not in the report that was attached, but I will certainly. I'm, I'm sorry, that. you're saying this presentation is not in the, it is, it's there. Well, I'm on the backup here. Could someone I'm please. I'm under 4E, uh, and I don't see the report. It's, the report. it's there. Is it? It's, uh, what, what's the number? 4E. The report is in, um, it's, I think in the consent section. It's six uh, C. Yeah, it's the Correct. C and the consent the section. Recourse. That's where they uh, we're going to be approving it uh, through consent. You know, six C. I don't understand why it's not under her presentation. It made it a little difficult. People were calling me asking me where it was. So perhaps you could tell the public why it's where it is. We, we you needed to accept her report as right. part of her duties, and so you can't accept something as a presentation item. So we put it in the very good. Thank you. Afterwards. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you for the clarification. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank Julia. you. No, I'm Mr. sorry. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, just point something out. I really appreciate you taking the time last week to walk me, walk me through this and really explain to me the scope of the audit because I had some missed expectations. And I know, Ms. Jellen, you weren't there. You weren't there for the beginning. The end was a lot better than the beginning. Um, and, um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to explain that to me, the scope. Um, the scope was to find um, where Old School Square was not compliant with their agreement. In an audit, I like to look at it from all perspectives. So I wish we would have had an audit that, because th these are the immediate questions I had, was were we compliant in this arrangement? That wasn't the scope of this audit, so OK. Um, when looking at the strategic plan and them submitting their strategic plan every year, but now we're going back and our auditor is saying it doesn't meet the standards of a strategic plan. Did anyone communicate that to Old School Square every year when they were submitting their strategic plan that it doesn't meet our standards? I think Ms. Jellin, you said probably not. Right? You don't know at the time, but you said probably not. If I had to give you an educated yeah. guess, it would be no, because there's default provisions in the lease that we would have put them on notice. I'm sorry, would you speak up into the microphone? Right. There's provisions in the lease that call, call for default so that we would have let them know and then they would have had a cure period. Right. So I Which did since do, we didn't, we probably continued submitting that version of a strategic plan because we didn't say anything the year before and say they didn't meet those standards. Um, but those are some of the things that, questions I had in regards to an audit, because when I think audit, this is, was in, incorrect in this case, this audit had a very specific scope. Find the areas in which Old School Square was not compliant to this lease. Um, you know, when I think of audits, I think we're gonna look at it holistically from you know, all angles, and I will be able to ask questions like that. So I just want my colleagues to know the questions that I did have, why they weren't answered, because that wasn't the scope you know, of the audit. I have looked at you know, other and spoke with other nonprofits. As a matter of fact, Spady even had a situation in 2016 where they came forward and said, we, we can't check this box. It wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be responsible for us. Um, and we haven't checked that box. And there was an exception made for them. Obviously, the example that was just given in regards to Arts Garage. And I believe prior to all of this, we were going to look at this agreement. Correct, Ms. Jalen? I think you brought that up at a public meeting that you felt like after going through all 48, 90, page, whatever many pages, this is probably something that we need to look at because it's a little strenuous as far as what the expectations are as far as reporting goes for a nonprofit. So um, those were just some of my thoughts, but I get it. I know that exactly what the scope of it is. This is the scope of it. This is the areas in which Old School Square was not compliant, and I appreciate all the time that you've put into it. May I? If I it, would you mind? Because I feel... Um, Commissioner Boylston, I was the one who suggested the audit. And 
The purpose behind that was not to look for areas where they weren't compliant. The purpose behind that was to give them the information they needed to come back and get in compliance. And it's unfortunate to me that it didn't work out that way. And I'm with you in, on some of this, like uh, the written statement, the th strategic plan. If they weren't in compliance on those, I wouldn't have cared. But when you're talking about auditors saying that their books don't reconcile, that's an issue. And when you're looking at some of these larger issues related to audits, related to budget information and other things, their annual budget, those are problems that are difficult to overlook. And I appreciate the fact that you tried to help them by providing the information they needed because you're right. Maybe they really didn't understand where are we lacking because maybe they didn't have the proper guidance in the past and they've had turnover and they've had issues. But when you have somebody like this who's qualified, who's looking to assist you, then you should be able to get yourself in compliance. And the fact that they couldn't, I'm not going to speculate about that, but it's suggestive. Yeah, and just, just to be clear, I'm not saying that anything in this report isn't a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, right. And we know now where they weren't compliant. Uh, for me, it's only a part of the story, but it is obviously a very big and clear point of not being compliant in their agreement. Um, but to, to say that the point, the point of the audit was to give them a chance to come into compliance but then we terminate them halfway through that process, it, which now they have, n they have no reason to continue because we've, it's been, it's finality. The termination is final. No wonder you didn't hear from them after the 11th. Well, here's a reason. Yeah. Um, they, can, they can apply for the RFP. So if they get themselves in compliance, they can actually come in and submit like everybody else and become the next group that comes in and be in compliance. So there is there there is a reason. Okay. So they, pardon me. They can do it without being compliant. They could. Well, I don't know if they can if they're going to be coming in as the same group because I think that they have to get themselves in compliance. It's not a good idea. Yeah, I don't know that anybody would select them. Yeah. So it's just a really weird way that that's the approach that's been taken by this commission and. To it the fact that they um, were corresponding, or our auditor was corresponding with them and letting them know what they needed. And then they lateraled a humongous stack of documents pretty much on the eve before the report was to be presented without even suggesting what the items are. It's like find a needle in a haystack. Maybe what you need is in here. That's not working cooperatively to get yourself in compliance. And it's unfortunate because, you know, maybe you could say I'm not, that's my perception of what transpired, but. I would have liked to have seen them make what appeared to, to be a real serious effort to get into compliance. I really would have. No, we gave them two weeks. We gave them two weeks. But and that wasn't your final report. That was just an update on the report. That was right? an update. Yeah. So it wasn't that that was due, the final report was due the next day and they just dropped that. We said we were going to work together. We started the audit. And I guess if, if you made the motion to start the audit and you, you did so, trying to help them. And then we only gave them two weeks and we didn't even let them finish the audit. So um, that, listen, I've said what I've wanted no, to it's a good say point. about You've that. Point I'm, I'm not defending anything that's in this report. I'm just saying I would like to see a, a, a holistic audit of the relationship between the two entities and then have a holistic conversation uh, about that relationship. But, but an audit on, would um, require a level of participation because we don't have the ability to audit them the way we can our own departments. We, we have to rely on them to provide the documentation. And one of the things that is interesting is there's a lot of use of the word inconsistent in this report that's concerning. So it would, in order for this to have worked or work, would require a level of cooperation and access. All right, great. Um, anything else? I, think I, I was just going to say they, they still do have an active lease, so they are still required to provide the documentation that we're talking about today. So there's some things I would do on September 1st. You know, if in the spirit of cooperation, they probably should send that to the commission if they want to, you know, further their their uh, interest in the city. 
but the, the lease is still active. It does have obligations that would go till the day of termination. And, and you know, I also want to mention, because it sounds like we're only talking about this one area, which is the audit, and that's not the, um, the overall uh, reason that actually brought us here to begin with. It was, uh, unfortunately, um, many months, I mean, many quarters of no, uh, several quarters of no payment, and also a, um, a renovation that wasn't, that, that's what brought this whole thing up to our attention, you know, no uh, with, the, with the renovation. Is when it we, no payment? We have not paid them with the with CRA. So there's another side of oh, this yeah, that we're not talking yeah. about yeah. that basically we don't talk about at this right. on this dais, but uh, or with this group. So I just want to mention that this is not the entire package here that we're speaking about. We're only speaking about what was not uh, in compliance with the lease and what how we exercised uh, our option. Anyway, uh, I don't think I don't. Is there anything more? Okay. I think that we're yes. good. So thank you so much. I just want to say one more thing. Um, not to prolong the conversation about it. Um, everyone seems to believe that it's a vacuum. We did not terminate the lease with cause. This is just something that uh, Commissioner Cassell asked for. We did it without cause. So yeah. we are not discussing any of the other areas. At least I'm not. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Julia. We appreciate your report. All right, moving on to comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda item from the public and also from the city manager. If you have anything from uh, a prior public comment that you'd like to respond to, Mr. City Manager, now would be your time. None at this time, Mayor. Thank All you. All right, very good. So we have public comment now. If anybody from the audience would like to speak, please step forward, state your name and address, and you will have three minutes. Thank you, Marjorie Ferrer, representing uh, Henry Morrison Flagler Chapter Daughters of the American Revolution. We thank you very much for your proclamation. Um, I like the frame. Um, thank you, Mayor and Commission members, for your support of the Constitution. Constitution Week is a commemoration of America's most important document, the United States Constitution. It is celebrated annually during the week of September 17 through 23. The U.S. Constitution was adopted by delegates of the DAR Constitutional Convention on September 17, 1787. The United States Constitution stands as a testament to the tenacity of Americans throughout history to maintain their liberties, freedoms, and inalienable rights. The celebration of the Constitution was started by the Daughters of the American Revolution. In 1955, DAR petitioned Congress to set aside September 17 through 23 annually to be dedicated for the observance of Constitution Week. The resolution was later adopted by the U.S. Congress and signed into public law on August 2nd, 1955 by President Dwight D. Eisenhower. For more than a century, the members of the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution have dedicated themselves to historical preservation, promotion of education, and encouragement of patriotic endeavor. DAR is a non-political membership organization of women with over one million daughters have, who, that over one million daughters have joined worldwide since the society's founding in 1890. Membership is granted to those whose lineage has been proven to a patriot who fought or aided in the cause of the American Revolution. Many people funded the American Revolution. They did not carry a gun. We stand on the eve of a grand commemoration. In July 2026, the United States will mark its 250th anniversary. Much like, the, much like the bicentennial celebration of 1976, this observance provides an exceptional opportunity for community involvement. Our six DAR Palm Beach County chapters have this opportunity to leave a lasting impact on our community through meaningful local projects and events during the anniversary. I look forward to reaching out to the special graduating class of 2026 each year until then with inspiring activities and community involvement. These students are now in the eighth grade. Constitution Week activities, um, the local libraries, all 17 county and six city public libraries were given a kit with a Constitution poster and the Declaration of Independence. Um, this Friday um, at 4 o'clock is when the Declaration, the uh, Constitution was actually signed, and there will be bell ringing all over this county. Many cities are using their fire trucks because they've got bells already on them. Uh, but you also have a bell app on your phone. I just learned that. Um, a little update on the Palm Beach School District. Um, Patriot podcasts have been added to the district internal website with links to all the teacher activities and lesson plans available on the DAR website. There's a lot of information. These podcasts. Go ahead. 
Go ahead. Can I finish? Okay. Yeah, you have, are, are your ladies were, are going to be speaking behind you or are they just standing with you? Okay, so here you can because, go right ahead. Yeah, I, okay. Um, well, we've added podcasts of the lesser known patriots that are available through the school system. Many of these patriots are black and brown. They've, you've never heard of them. Many of them are women. Um, and in the activities only five years away for America 250. We're, I'm collaborating with school member Erica Whitfield to create a steering committee within the school district to brainstorm ideas for, the, for these kids. What we really want to do is something for them while they're in eighth grade. I would like to be able to give each one of them a copy of the Constitution, which I gave all of you. I haven't given you one, Ms. Kinsell. You can have this one. Thank you. Um, that says inside, my name is Marjorie Ferrer. I realize I'm, I'm special. I'm going to be in the graduating class of 2026. I need to understand what this says. I'm going to be voting. I'm going to be entering the military. I'm going to college. I need to know what this says. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, then to do something when they're in ninth grade, when they're in 10th grade, 11th and 12th grade. So when this group of, I think, 10,000 students in Palm Beach County, when they graduate, they will be so smart. And they'll know everything about our Constitution. So that's what we're working on. I have, um, just in case you, you lost them from the last time, your Constitution Week poster and a Declaration of Independence. I have a set of the uh, baseball cards of the uh, lesser known patriots and also one of our very cool bookmarks that have interesting things on. So that's for you all. And I'm sorry we went over time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much for it's the It's great to hand off that proclamation. And read your proclamations again. Friday, 4 o'clock, ring a bell. Very good. Thank you so much. May I? May I? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, as a high schooler, I was somehow or another asked to participate in becoming a member of the DAR. And I met with Ms. Farrar. And Ms. I believe you won a contest, didn't you? Yes, I did. The essay contest? <laughs> yes, I did. Good. And unfortunately, I haven't completed my application to become formal, but okay. now you've reinvigorated me. We will help you. It's, it's difficult, but, um, you know, for a lot of the um, patriots that helped that cannot define their lineage back because they got, uh, during the Civil War, a lot I of the documents. Christmas addicts. I'm sorry? I claim Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks was very cool. Yes. And if I may. Sure. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I wanted to say that um, my great aunt is a daughter, or she passed. She was. And if you have relatives who are members, then through that lineage, you can connect. Yes. And are you a member? I'm not, but I feel like I should be. You I've should be. actually looked into it a few times, but I need to provide you with all her information. You do. It, but we have. Um, well, they, she left, but our registrar was here, and she's very good at finding Contact the lineage. Marjorie. Marjorie okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks for your Thank time. Thank you so much. Commissioner Cassell, okay. we have something we'll have to complete. Thank you yeah. very much, Marjorie. Thank you. Yes. One, it's Hi. very good to see you. Thank you. Uh, and Dolores from the City Commission office yes. will meet you in the lobby. She's got uh, city pins for each one of you. Oh, cool. Very cool. Read your constitutions. Ring a bell. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Will do. All right. Anyone else for public comment? Come on up. Okay. State your name and address, and uh, you'll have three minutes. My name is Edward Walters. I live at 2361 Jagger Drive, uh, which is just south of Linton by the um, uh, Lavers Tennis Center. And I'm here to just briefly bring your attention to a landscaping problem. And I have some photographs. May I come forward just to hand them off um, to you? You guys? give them to the clerk. Okay. There's, uh, there's six copies. There's, there's, there's one. Um, I've, I've lived at that address for uh, 19 years, going on 20 in April, um, and uh, my family lives there. And um, the first person that I was dealing with was David Glover, who works um, in the Parks Department. He helped me with a landscaping problem I was having at the development that I live at. And then I called him, and he said, he said he can, first of all, he confirmed that it's city property, and um, but he said, I don't, I, I can't help you with it. It's the Parks Department. And I said, okay. And he gave me um, uh, Sinovane Stevens. Uh, he referred me to him, and I called him, and he said, he's, he was polite to me, but he said, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. Those trees are healthy, um, and um, so I'm not going to cut down any healthy trees. Well, if you look at the photographs, there's, there's um, you know, the, the, the photograph number one is just kind of a shot of the street. There's a series of palm trees in that area, kind of alternating palm tree, oak tree, palm tree, oak tree. The oak trees are fine. There's absolutely no invasive, invasive species on any of the oak trees. On the palm trees, though, it's extensive. There's these 
invasive non-native, I would guess, I'm not any kind of a botanist, but non-native uh, species that have invaded. That's the worst one. It's like a Franken tree. There's a tree growing out of the sable palm tree. Um, and uh, hang on, I got my talking points here. Um, one problem that I wanted to bring your attention to, first of all, it's an eyesore. The city is a, a you know, very tennis-friendly city. A lot of budget money is orientated toward tennis, which is fine. But I don't think we're putting our best foot forward um, when you have these ugly trees there, OK? You could cut them down, pull them out, put in oak trees, which you know, I think a botanist would confirm are not going to be a problem as far as being invaded, because the existing oak trees are not invaded. Uh, I've see, even seen the occasional raccoon coming down out of that particular tree that I've got a photograph of. Seems like a possibility <laughs> of a liability issue. You have people coming, both people in Del Rey and people from out of town coming in, you know, youth tennis tournaments on the weekend, snowbirds coming down playing tennis. It seems like a problem to me that um, you might want to consider addressing. Um, that's basically all I have to say on the subject, and I thank you very much for any consideration you could give to this, um, you know, just make our neighborhood look a lot better. Um, it's real an eyesore. Sir, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so the picture number two. Yes. You've got a, um, like a sable palm or something on the lower side, then you got this big, huge tree, but there's something in the middle that's kind of like dead, it looks like. So are we talking about the entire thing there, or is it just that one sable palm? Is that growth that's, of the that's the worst. That's the worst case. If you go from, from, from down to the end of the street, mm -hmm. Go, going north to where you turn into the parking lots, yep. there are a series of trees like that. That is that is the worst. Okay. Where you have this tree growing out, out of, of the tree. sable palm tree. Gotcha. The others, you know, you, you you go down there, you see the invasive trees. He's wrapped all around the palm trees. So so it's the big tree here that you're talking about that's invasive. Yes. Big, huge tree. Yes, that gotcha. one. Okay. It, I don't. I'm not the best photographer, but it's, no, it's I get going it. out of. Yes. You can tree. see that. I just didn't know yeah. if that's what you were speaking about or if it was like something underneath that was yeah. dead. But you're talking about that entire tree growing out because I can see that you've got the uh, the oak on the right. So that would be. Yeah. yeah and the good. oaks are fine. You go there, got you it. walk down there, the oaks are fine. And so what I'm asking for basically is just pull the trees out. Yeah. Just, just pull them out. I know it costs cost money like everything does, but put some oaks in. I think it would be a good investment. And you might clear up a small liability issue okay. as well. All right, thank That's you. Okay. City manager has that information. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thanks for coming in. Yep. Anyone else? Hello. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. I um, simply want to introduce myself. I am Jennifer Thomason, very proud to have been recently chosen to be the new CEO for Habitat for Humanity of South Palm Beach County. Uh, we are at 181 Southeast Fifth Avenue, right here off of Atlantic. I grew up in Delray Beach, been here my whole life, and I'm so excited to be working with this amazing group of people to serve the residents of Delray. So simple introduction. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you. Looking forward to meeting with you. Who else? Anyone? Seeing no one. Public comment is closed. Moving on to consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. All the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. All right, so moving on to regular agenda, item number seven. We've got the Public Art Advisory Board um, Memorandum on Projects. Mr. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor, okay. uh, Vice Mayor, Deputy uh, Vice Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Duncan DeVars, Assistant City Manager. However, tonight I'm before you as the Public Art Advisory Board uh, liaison and the first item you have one of two tonight from the the board the first one is really kind of their work plan that they're presenting to you um, in an effort to get your acceptance it's a number of items on there some have more detail than others depending on you know the amount of research that we were able to do to present this to you the board really wants to um, hear from you if you have any comments before they go any further into investigating any of those items. Uh, each item, if there's a monetary cost, does come back before you for approval. So I don't know if there's any comment from the commission or? Questions, comments? Seeing none? 
So you're looking for but direction, no? Yeah, it just uh, in, in case there was direction for the board to take it back to them, they are an advisory board to the commission. So I think they want to make sure that they're uh, on the right uh, direction. I would, I would have to tell you, the, the only thing that I would like to at least make, make sure and relay, I mean, I love the idea of using local artists for some of the art pieces that they have out there, which is great. But um, too much of a good one thing is not always great, if you understand what I'm saying. So it's kind of nice to mix it up a little bit. I mean, that's the only thing I would say because art is, you know, it's kind of like in the eye of the beholder. But if it's just one sculpture, you know, sculpture artist doing the same thing or not the same thing, but sim similar pieces, I, I think it gets, you know, less exciting for the public. So they're, they've done a great job up to this point. I just that's what I would recommend. Sure. May I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. I agree with that recommendation. Uh, the utility box wrapping, um, the cost would be approximately uh, 700 to 850 per box. And would that be something we would be paying, the city would be asked to pay? Yes, so there is uh, the art fund that uh, comes from um, basically a percentage of construction value. Right. There's about $40,000 in that fund right now. How many uh, utility boxes? So that would be uh, need to be determined. It's not the easiest of programs right. because of the utility boxes being owned by It also depends entities. on their location. You'd pri prioritize right. location it, because it sounds lovely, but um, the question is how many can we accommodate, where are they, et cetera. So I guess you'll just continue working on this and provide us the information in the future. Right. Before anything is installed or any money is expended, right. we would come back to you to present that idea and locations. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anyone else? You need a motion? Um, no, I think no? it's just direction. Just direction? Just so direction. Yeah. All right. May I just ask one more? When do you ha plan on having the assessment of the uh, city-owned art? So um, first of all, there's an inventory that needs to happen. And right. in fact, uh, the DDA, who are here tonight, have uh, made great inroads in that, uh, actually. And we're working with them. In fact, they're a permanent item on the advisory board's agenda because mm -hmm. of all the work that they're doing in the art realm. Okay. So that there's collaboration and we don't, uh, you know, both do uh, the same project at the same time. So I defer to the DDA. They're, they actually are going to launch their art uh, portal on their website on October 1. This is, uh, I'll do your plug for you. <laughs> so um, they, in fact, uh, have spent, what, 10 months doing the inventory and trying to get this together. So it's no small task. And in fact, we think there's art that we don't have an inventory for. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the, the plan before we can even assess it to see what needs to um, be touched up or, or right. cleaned up. You know, the DDA is also uh, in, instrumental in repairing the pineapples that are in Pineapple Grove mm -hmm. on the wall, the mural there. So that, again, is a collaboration that maybe we can get involved in. We really are behind. Uh, from the administration view, and I'll throw that out there because, uh, right. and their work has been uh, monumental in helping this board move forward. So, thank you. I'd like to. Yeah, and I guess I'll. Be before you leave. Leave them for the, for everybody. But uh, October first, their portal opens on their website. We'll have a link on, on our website to that. Ms. Mayor has a question. Yes, I have a question. Thank you. Um, in the future, when we're discussing donation of art or the subject of art, I think it would be helpful if we had a better understanding as to what is going to encompass the entire project. I have um, been a part of about three uh, different discussions, and the last one, and I'm not saying anything about it, we've already approved it, the statute that we discussed, not one time did we talk about giving any money for the statute. I think it's the next item. Are you referring to that? It probably is. I thought okay. it was under consent. But anyhow, no. um, when we were talking about it, it would have been nice at that time to have at least guessed or estimated not to wait and say, OK, we're going to do it, and then turn around and say, we're going to be charged. And the maintenance is also something that well, that leads us right We're into uh, 7B. Right. I, yeah. Thank you. Why don't I you go ahead and start yeah. 7B, and then we'll have that question. Um, yes, thank answered. you. 
You got it. Sure. So, um, again, hello. <laughs> so your second item from the Public Art Advisory Board is um, an item about a statue. So previously, the uh, board came to you through the staff to talk about two statues that, uh, or sculptures, I should say, that were going to be either be donated or be loaned from the Pineapple Grove uh, Main Street to the city. And there were a number of, present. there was a presentation of different locations, there was discussion um, about those locations. Staff were directed by the commission to come back with whatever agreement ended up happening, whether it was a loan or a, a gift. And since that time, negotiations have fallen through with uh, Pineapple Grove for uh, a number of reasons. I personally have spent some time with Pineapple Grove representatives as well as the sculptor mm -hmm. who was in negotiation with Pineapple Grove on those sculptures. Uh, that being uh, what it is, they are no longer available through Pineapple Grove as a loan or a donation. And the sculptor felt that it was important enough as his uh, legacy, if you will, to the city to appear before the Public Advisory uh, Art Advisory Board with his offer to purchase a statue. Shy Dancer. This is one of the two that were actually discussed at commission uh, a couple of months ago. So Shy Dancer is available, and the uh, advisory board liked the idea of purchasing this because a donation or a loan were no longer available, and a recommended to come to you with the price tag of $5,000 to purchase Shy Dancer and to install it at the location that was discussed with you a couple of months ago. So before you is a request from the board asking on your direction or your vote to purchase Shy Dancer for $5,000. Would that, uh, would you be uh, requesting that that 5,000 come out of that $40,000 fund? Correct, it would come out of the art fund. So um, I don't think, I, I mean, first, I think we need to know how many of these utility boxes we need to wrap and what the money situation is. I wouldn't be inclined to vote for this. I think when it was being offered as a loan or a donation, we were reluctant to take it because Ms. Johnson made the fabulous point about installation and liability. And now we're talking about paying for it and then having the installation and the liability but not knowing what, how much money we actually have and how we want to prioritize it within the project. So is it possible to ask for you to come back uh, with this once you have your inventory and we know how many utility boxes? So we know if we have an extra 5,000 lying around, we may say, okay, it's, it would be lovely. If we don't and we're trading it off for something else, like wrapping a utility box, which sounds like a great idea, we may say we don't want to do that. So, and to the mayor's point, do, have, do we have um, other work of this artist's? We do. In fact, there's one other piece that uh, is on display. It is actually um, an abstract, abstract tree with a yellow bird, mm -hmm. if you recall that. Yes. It's mm -hmm. on 3rd at 2nd mm -hmm. uh, Avenue, so not like it. too far from this location, actually. Well, that was my position. I so the only thing, if I may, um, you know, the art board had a, a laundry list of items that they wanted to, to uh, tackle, mm -hmm. and they don't have the funding for all of them. Right. Uh, we, so they may, you know, once we get through the utility process, which I, I can't give you a timeline on that, um, you know, it, something off their list is, has to give or right. has to be put on hold to a future date when there is funding available. Did they um, prioritize did this installation? So, be, technically, it, it, they voted to come before you tonight. Yeah, right. So Just that would be a priority. $40,000 on this. Correct. So let me ask the other question. Did they prioritize the boxes over this or no? No. Okay. No. Okay. So there, this... These were twofold. They started working on their project list months and months mm -hmm. ago. So when I became the liaison, I made sure I took it back to them. We actually have some new members, so I wanted to make sure that the board was um, okay with what was going to be presented to you as their overall arching uh, plan, if you will. 
this came out of left field because of course we went in one direction and then uh, pivoted and came before the board. So they felt it was important enough to, sorry, um, I'm messing around with your presentation. Uh, but they thought it was important enough to make the recommendation, but obviously the decision is at the commission level. Got it. So this advisory board, they have, the board is tied to a fund, which has currently has $40,000 in it. Correct. It can vote on how they want to spend those funds, but it has to be stamped and approved by us. Correct. Right. And, and the commission could always authorize the use of the fund outside of the advisory board, the way it's structured. So. Okay. Well, in my opinion, the reason we have these boards and we appoint them with the proper people is to make these types of decisions and to use their fund appropriately. So, of course, I would be in favor of their request. Anyone else? If, if, if I may, there's one other sort of caveat, if you will. I know Mr. Wyman has lost his lease at his place. Uh, it's actually, you know, down by the um, mm -hmm. arts warehouse. Okay. So he does, it doesn't look like he's going to be in town much longer. So the offer may not be available in a few months, but um, that's neither here nor there, I guess. But uh, that is something that he has discussed. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, um, Mayor. I'm a little concerned that uh, although the advisory board might have a $40,000 budget, I don't know about this wrapping. Uh, I would imagine that's something that might be of a safety issue. I don't know. Oh, the utility boxes? No, utility it's boxes. not. Utility boxes, okay, very good. Um, they are an advisory board, and I know that we are constantly being asked to fund other projects that start off being a gift, a donation, and then the city is held responsible for something that we have an open-ended um, requirement of. I bring to mind our lovely rainbow that every time I hear about it, it's a liability. The paint's not looking good. It's not holding up. Um, it's dangerous because it's slippery if you're um, on a motorbike or anything other than a car. And if it's rainy or drizzly or the concrete, the, the pavement is wet, you're, at, uh, you're being exposed to perhaps an accident because your wheels spin. So that would be something that our police department really should weigh in on because if we have a safety issue at that intersection and there's an accident, I'm sure that someone is going to see an opportunity to sue the city. So all I'm saying, commissioners, is that we should be very careful about the uh, projects that we uh, fund and approve because we are not just doing a one time and done thing. It's something that we should look into the future as best we can. We're not soothsayers, but um, learn from the past. And everything that comes down the pike might not necessarily be something that we'll want to do. Thank you. Anyone else? Entertain a motion? Motion to approve the purchase of Shy Dancer recommended by the Art Advisory Board. I'll second the motion. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? No. Mayor Petrolia? I'm going to say yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? I'm going with Ms. Johnson on that one. No. Mr. Boston? Yes. Okay. We'll have a new piece of art in, um, on, in Pineapple Grove. And if, if I may take this opportunity, we have a, a, it's all things art tonight. We have a mural unveiling, which I believe you've just recently been invited to, the Heritage Mural by Catherine Strong Park. So that's going to be Friday at 2.30. So this is another sort of long-term project that the advisory board has uh, initiated that had come to you. So we're glad that it's finally finished and able to be unveiled. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you for that update too. All right. So moving on to, I think I moved ahead of myself here. Emergency regulations. Yes. Seven uh, C ratification of emergency emergency regulations. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay, moving on to the nomination for appointment for Affordable Housing Advisory Committee, we start with uh, Commissioner Cassell. Thank you. I would like to nominate Richard Kasser. Second. Thank you. Any comments, concerns, questions? I just, I just wanted to make sure um, we have that list 
I think he's uh, on the, uh, the uh, in the top category. He might be in two. Which, yeah, which seat is he filling, just so we know which ones um, we have to fill? Hang on one second. Harry might be able to I help I have to with open that. it. I'm, I apologize. Give me a moment. Because oh. I know there's very specific there's ones. There's four areas, and I think he's in mm -hmm. the top. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, it's okay. I'm opening it right this second. Yeah. Is it residential home building? He yes. is under, yes, A, yes. engaged okay. in residential home building. Thank you. Great. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Okay, um, now to uh, Mr. Bolston? Yes, I'd like to appoint Kristen Cox. Second. Any comments, concerns? Call the roll, please. Oh, it, what is her, um, what is that? That would be mean? engaged as a not-for-profit provider of affordable okay. housing. Not-for-profit, let's see. All right, so um, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Moving on to Ms. Johnson? Uh, I'm going to put forward Mr. Pasquale uh, Ken, Kentanon, Kentani? Kentani, yeah. Second. And I don't know what. Um, Do, does that fill the? He's, she's. He, I'm sorry, he, excuse Sorry. me, Bear, is also under category A, I believe, uh, Ms. Johnson. Now, are either of them involved in being a provider of affordable housing? Mine does not appear to be. He's only in, I thought he was in two categories, uh, but he's actually only falls in that one category. Got it. I, I'm really confused about this whole I thing. No, it's very difficult. It's <laughs> very confusing yeah. because none of this was on the application. Right. Right. So I don't know why and how they're they're this applying for it for because it out. is it's just a little beyond the pale. Well, I, I it's agree. It's on the cover report and it says there are four categories and then there's a sub chart that exactly, lists Exactly, the but they next didn't next tell year. how these applicants, how they were applying. Well, so maybe I need to just pass on this and, and come back the next time. And, Thank and you, Mayor. Uh, bring it next week. We'll, I'll get with the city clerk and we'll decide. Maybe there are not enough candidates on here. Mayor, can I just comment yes. on this yes. item? Um, I'm glad that we at least had to have two that are being added. The Affordable Housing Committee, we have not been able to uh, pull together a quorum. Yeah. Uh, because it is state regulated, we are not able to have um, approved quorum for yeah. video. We have to have everyone, once everyone is there physically, yeah. then we can do a quorum for people then to attend video, which doesn't happen. Um, and of course with COVID, that's been challenging, but what made it even more challenging is that we had so many vacant seats. So as board members, we've all been getting applications in, which is great, but as you can see, it's very specific um, seats that need to be filled. I did have a question in regards to the vacant seat for the planning and zoning board member. Do we not appoint that? No, I think the planning and zoning board amongst themselves chooses someone like and then do. you ratify it. May I go back for a moment? Because maybe her uh, choice actually works. If you read the specific terminology, it says, um, that allow for fewer than 11 members if they are unable to find representatives who meet the following criteria. So it doesn't say that we have to put one in each criteria, but just that they meet the criteria. Is that your understanding of the reading of this, Attorney Jellin? Um, it was just confusing. There was I no understand totally. Can you check on that and then we can let's, just let's deal with it next it week? It, this is yeah. governed by Florida statute, and okay. so I would hate to appoint someone in right. that. Yeah, we have yeah. So that. let's just go ahead and let so you deal with it, and then we, you can. Let us know what candidates are available for next. Um, I think the ones selection. you selected are fine. Yeah, and then we'll but come back. Should we pull them back in case? Uh, no. Okay. Just let because that way they can have that. Trust quorum. me, we need those too. Like okay. we have to have a state mandated yeah. meeting. Like I think okay. the planning and zoning board meets. I think next week, and they're going to on the twentieth. I believe they have to give us meeting. another one. Yes. All right. I, perfect. I had, if, if possible, I'd like to ask a couple of questions, and maybe in the discussions that can be answered at the next city commission meeting, not the next one. That's mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, Number one, if this is state required and we can't get applicants to fit, how are we going to be held accountable for it? Yeah, I think, yeah, and that's one question you can answer. Secondly, you only are going to meet twice a year. I did get that. No, we're trying to. We're, no, we're not twice a year. Well, that's what the we're trying to. You know, we're trying clerk to said. For. Yeah, that's the. And I'd like to have a better discussion as to what the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee is going to be advising the City Commission on, because everyone knows that the 
uh, affordable housing is the hottest, newest buzzword topic from the federal level down to the city level. So I, again, I don't want to say workshop, but it You've got might a really be. engaged group there, and yes, they're only required to meet two times a year, but they actually would want to meet more, but guess what? Can't vote on it. Mm -hmm. Have so to have a quorum. Don't have a quorum. quorum. Quorum of eleven. So. Of eleven. <laughs> quorum of the. Uh, now they will with it with the two editions that we just did tonight. I'm saying that the total number who must meet in order to have a quorum is eleven. No. Or no, no, no. A quorum of eleven. Of eleven. Yeah, we need six of those. Six. Right. But it's all in person. Mm -hmm. We're not able to do it right. via Zoom. I understand. Thank you very much. This would be great. Thank you. All Thank right. You. So moving on, and we'll get that uh, the. The rest of the nominations on next week. Um, 7E, City of Delray Beach, COVID temporary measures. Nathanthea. Hello. Hi. Anthea Genetis Development Services, for the record, but this is a bit of a group effort, and you may need someone besides me to weigh in on some of these things. So, um, so the last time we discussed this, I think, was back in May. And at the time, we decided to extend several initiatives until September 30th. Um, so just kind of going over them one by one, um, expanding the sidewalk use area for sidewalk cafes is no longer needed. We've simply, um, with uh, the renewals in June, have started to just incorporate those spaces on a case-by-case -case basis into the actual applications, the formal applications that they have now. So this is no longer needed as a COVID-19 temporary measure, and they are paying the square footage amount like all of the other restaurants, you know, and typically the way that works. Uh, the designated delivery spaces have sort of naturally phased themselves out. There may be a couple of left, left, but as um, on-street parking has the first 20 minutes free, and then the, it moves into, um, you know, regular on-street spaces that are in more demand now, that's kind of moved on on its own, and we're not hearing um, a request for maintaining a, any of them, but if we do, it's, it's a simple thing to accommodate. Um, the DDA has had a storefront activation plan. We haven't had any complaints or anything related to some of their graphic strategies, and so um, that just is an ongoing effort, and if that's okay to sort of continue on a case-by-case -case basis with that partner, that's how we would do that. And the only reason it requires a blessing is that some of the, um, the graphics in the storefronts might exceed um, opaque and, and different signage rules, but um, we're still in recovery, and so that's um, recommended to just be an ongoing partnership with them. Um, the ones that are a little bit more, um, I think, substantial efforts that the city made that are ongoing are the private, um, the temporary outdoor use areas on private property. Um, where area that uh, is either sidewalk or, the example of third and third, um, parking spaces have been converted into other areas. Um, the difference between doing that as a temporary measure and, of course, uh, maintaining them permanently would result in things like parking requirements, um, you know, maybe more substantial improvements, but um, we haven't had any complaints, very little complaints, including noise about the ones that are associated with restaurants. Um, and so the question ultimately is whether these can continue past September 30th, and if so, how long before we re revisit them again? Um, standalone bars in the city are not typically allowed to be outside. Um, we have nine, we started the pandemic with 10, we have nine. Um, not all of them are utilizing outdoor spaces, um, and the question is those that are, should we continue um, to allow those to be outside? The ones that are associated, I want to be really clear on this, the ones that are associated with the temporary outdoor use area at this point that still have them, um, we have had fewer and fewer complaints over time, including for noise. We're going to have a discussion about noise at tomorrow's workshop, but these, the ones that are um, in, in this program are not um, currently a source of, of problems. There were some some adjustments that we had to make when we first launched it, but um, so far so good at this point. Um, and then finally, um, there was a relaxing of the sign code. This was, you know, something that was needed when um, there were different capacities that were in play, and are you open, are you not, is it just takeout, are you seating, you know, all of those things. I think um, 
We were a little reluctant to continue that at the last discussion. We're worried about taking up necessary space that we have on the sidewalks, things like that. Um, so the question of whether this type of signage or A-frame signage should be um, continued, be outside of what is normally allowed at this stage. Um, you know, it is a little bit confusing for staff to try to figure out what's allowed and what's not allowed when it's not following the rules and it's something smaller like that. So, um, you know, the question at this point is, are they really necessary given that everybody's at full capacity and open for business? Um, and then finally, um, special events. Um, there was um, sort of a moratorium on the privately sponsored events. They were, then they were coming through CTAC and being considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And at this point, um, the question is whether we can resume a normal process, understanding that normal now will always include COVID protocols until the world changes a little bit. Um, and so if that's okay to, in this case, not extend the restrictions, I guess, and not continue, you know, the private outdoor spaces are giving a little bit more. This is a question of whether it's time to sort of go back to having events processed as normal um, through the regular process. And if you have detailed questions about that, I'm hoping Sam is behind me, yes. <laughs> and, and um, you know, that Laura from the DDA is here as well if you have questions, so. And that, that's it for us. So I, I don't know how you want to go through these in terms of, of which I can hit slide by slide if you want to give us direction. I don't know, whatever is easiest for you. Whichever one, do you discussion. need us to make the decisions on? Why don't we do that one by one so that you can kind of get a sense? Why don't we start with the last one first, uh -huh. since Sam is standing behind me, about special events and what kind of direction we need at this point. Good evening once again. Um, the, Anthea did a great job kind of explaining this. As you know, we kind of put in um, some restrictions kind of limiting our special events purview through the pandemic um, was more strict in the beginning. We relaxed it a little bit and we had more throughout the, the past, you know, summer and so on. Um, I'd like to take this moment to say thank you as a team. I think we've all kind of navigated that, you know, decently well with still having some events and, and doing it in a smart way. So um, I think um, the team is prepared and, and Laura can support this as well as that we're prepared to move forward in a more normal process, like Anthea said, understanding that this is something that we deal with. Uh, we're seeing more and more cities return to their events and, and, and we think we can manage that in a good way. You know, I was just gonna say, I'm glad you're starting with the last one first because that's the one that's most concerning to me only because of the fact that just over the weekend we had, you know, um, spikes and, and um, reports of how many, you know, cases we're seeing. I know that um, even though the uh, there are deaths, you know, we're still seeing in the state of Florida, it was almost 2,500 um, on Sunday that they were reporting and another 100,000 cases. Um, it's not as severe because we have a lot of people with the injections, the, the vaccines. So I think that that's something that, you know, the, the panel up here has to really kind of weigh. It's not an easy decision because we don't want to be, you know, promoting something at a time when um, this is kind of surging still in, in the state of Florida, especially, uh, and being part of that. Um, you know, I wish everybody would just get vaccines because it seems like um, those with vaccines don't necessary there, there's such a sm uh, lower death rate and that that really makes a difference um, but that's that's the one thing I want to just mention um, I mean I, w I want nothing more than to go back to normal but I'm concerned about it just at this stage at this point um, I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say however may I um, be yes, first go right ahead wait in. Uh, weigh in rather I am very concerned that in the effort to rush and I don't say rush to return to normal we might be assisting in the continuous spread and high occurrence of this virus because everyone is not required to be vaccinated. Everyone is um, um, sometimes they're just allowed to do whatever they're allowed to do. And there is no tracing. There is no uh, quarantining, uh, forced quarantining. If you know you've been exposed to COVID, you don't know for another five, sometimes to six days that uh, you may be positive. So I think this hit and miss, I'm in um, support of continuing the moratorium. And I would say, uh, hopefully we can do the same thing we did last year with our Christmas tree. But um, until we come down on this, I would be opposed to any ending. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes ma'am. I, I feel like we're already back. I mean, if you go downtown for dinner, everybody's out. 
the question really is, what are the event events coming forward? And can we implement some of our COVID practices going forward, masking and what have you, for extra safety? In other words, can we do it to the standard we did before vac vaccines were available and make it safe, but move forward? Because that is kind of where we're at. Um, yeah. If that was the question, the, the truth of the matter is it, it depends on the event, and that's one of the things we've all kind of discussed over the last 18 months is that each event is individual. Um, right. What we would consider more of like a, your controlled events, your single point of entry or one or two point of entry, it's yes. much easier to control a masking environment. A more open-ended event where people come and go freely, um, something in the downtown corridor, for example, is a much, you know, a next to impossible way to, um, you know, implement a masking mandate. So, so your outdoor lighting. events are more... How would you visualize the tree lighting? Is there a way to make it safe? I mean, okay, so that's Laura's saying yes. And so I think that's really what we would probably, or my speaking for myself, I just want you to say we're going to implement uh, precautionary measures and we're going to make it safe. And if we can do that, I think we should proceed. Thank you. Uh, so Laura Simon, uh, Director of the Downtown Development Authority. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Anthea. Thank you, everybody, for um, taking the time to review these. Um, events are a part of our, our community and our culture, and I think uh, this past weekend, I don't know if you all realize, we did have a craft show mm -hmm. um, sponsored by Howard Allen Events. And, um, excuse me. So he, then it was very uh, nicely attended. Um, they had it sp spread out. Um, they had signage saying masks were requested, uh, hand sanitizing stations available. The crowd, while it's September, it's still very um, small, and it was a small and scale show. Um, small in um, and spread out events are also ways to do it. There's a lot of creative ways why we don't produce the um, tree lighting event. We have been working really closely with Sam's team and the city part and the parks recreation team on providing recommendations with that, whether it's um, lighting the tree prior and then having an, an event of celebration where Santa arrives or having Santa arrive in a variety of ways that um, could be not um, creating those crowds. So having just and using the whole space, live streaming it in different blocks in down Atlantic Avenue versus all being in one location waiting for the tree to turn on. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities. I think it's just, you know, again, relying on the team that's here are the experts to put into place and the practices that um, we've been on training seminars and webinars and just learning from other cities of how they're doing it and what's working in other communities. So, and then watching it on a, on a constant basis. But I think moving forward, you know, the community wants to come back together um, while they're, everyone's dining and their things are happening on our, in our, on our weekends. Um, there's still other areas of our, of our downtown and of our city that aren't seeing that as well. Uh, that could utis utilize some of these extra, extra uh, spurses of entertainment and, and excitement. So, I do think there's opportunity for us to continue, as the staff has been reviewing these plans and these programs that are coming along, like trick or treating, on Halloween or the Halloween parade. Or, yeah. um, but they've put in measures in place that are are appropriate for the current conditions, the new normal, if you will. And I think that just trusting them with that um, direction, I think, is just really important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting because the last few months I've been traveling. Uh, last week I was in Rhode Island and I get off the uh, airplane, walk through the airport, and everything shut down. I was, I was shocked. You know, I haven't been there since pre-COVID. Uh, I spent a couple of weeks with my parents in Toledo, Ohio. They just had huge events downtown for the Sondheim Cup, which, uh, uh, which is the female version of the Ryder Cup, um, where they had outdoor concerts and this and that, and no one's wearing masks. I mean, let's, let's be realistic. And then right before we started the meeting, Sharon Painter said, you must have gone to the Ohio State football game, and I'm thinking to myself, no way. I'm not going to sit with 100,000 people. <laughs> and it was one of the first games they've not sold out, and it was a big game. Um, so I think the only way to control it effectively is people are going to choose yeah. whether they're going to go or they're not going to go. And, you know, you sp I bring up football. Saturday and Sunday you see crowds of hundreds of thousands in, in all these stadiums. Yeah. So, I mean, to think that everyone's going to take these precautions uh, seriously, I mean, that's a joke. Let's, let's be honest. 
Um, however, I think people are getting back to normal and they want, and if you were on the avenue this weekend, it's like spring break. I hate to say it. You know, I'm, I walked through the festival yesterday. It was uh, sparsely, it was steady. I wouldn't say it was packed. But I think, you know, they were doing a good job and no one was wearing a mask, I'm sorry to say. But, you know, that's people's choices and I, and I get it. But I'm kind of, I, I share the concerns, but I think it's kind of like ready to, to s slowly start back up with the caveat that, you know, who knows if there's going to be another variant next month. <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah, so that's where that's I'm at. That. We got to keep an eye out. I, I look at this, the sports stadiums and the music venues, yeah. um, they're open, schools, universities um, opening back up. Um, you know, I think we need to. I think we need to move forward. I think we need to go back to having these events, and people will, you know, will make that decision uh, for themselves. You know, a big turning point was when the thanks Macy's Day Thanksgiving Parade announced that they are returning this year. Mm -hmm. um, so that I mean, that's that's a pretty big, you know, pretty big statement that New York is is gonna is gonna return to a normal Thanksgiving Day Parade. So I would be in favor of resuming the normal, right, the new normal process while considering COVID-19 protocols. And what I've, what I've recognized across all those examples um, is that there's areas you can control, there's areas you can't. So making sure that we are controlling the areas that we can, which is usually a lot of the, our internal uh, people and internal processes. All right, so I think you have your consensus on that. And we can Thank move you. on to the next one. Thank you. A-frame signs and the various signage that we have been a little loose on downtown since we're kind of back operating generally as usual. Is it time to put those extra signs away? Anyone? Um, I know I already know what my my, <laughs> my colleague to the right is going to say. So why don't you start it off? So whenever you know I'm going out for lunch during the week and I'm walking from my office and I see a big sign that says public parking. And I'm not going to identify it because I don't think it would be fair, but here's what I'm thinking. They're taking money away from the city <laughs> with that big sign that may or may not should be there. Um, I hate the signs. I think it cheapens things up, so that's where I'm at. <laughs> that's no surprise. Anyone else? Yeah, I think it's time to sunset. Okay. Sunset. What, here's the honest concern I have because I'm downtown quite a bit. You see, there's so many people working right now for delivery dudes and those kind of places, and they have nowhere to park. So and not that a lot of people are getting food at home instead of going out. The business, is there a way we can just keep – we do have some signs that designate spots for, for pickup. I think there's another. No, this is Next just a, one. <laughs> just a regular, regular sign. Okay, the A-frame signs. Oh, oh, oh. Just okay. I'm sorry. I thought this encompassed all Too many all signs, signs, Commissioner. Sorry. <laughs> too get many my signs. Straight. Right. Yes, I think I you've agree. got your. Okay. You got your. Okay. I'm with you. All you right. Got it. So then, um, okay. This these are a little bit easier then. Um, oh, designated delivery space. I'm sorry because it was crossed off. I was. Yeah, they sort of phased themselves out. But if you want to discuss yeah. them, we can. I mean, there's a couple. You don't. You think it's more. Which fun. number are we on? I, I think okay. what if if, yeah. if they phased themselves out, I think that just let it go that as it is for that. now, and then you know we can always remove the final ones eventually. But you know that's the you know, the sign the the um, what you were talking about. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So we have let um, a couple of things happen with outdoor use areas. Of course, the standalone um, bars, which are typically not allowed to be outside. There are several that still have them. Um, mm -hmm. We have not had complaints about them in a really long time. So the fits and starts we had at the beginning, we've not continued to have complaints. And then the other ones that are associated more with restaurants. Um, some of them still have them, some of them don't. Um, but we had one uh, requested as early as a week before the agenda package went out. Um, so they, there is still an interest in having outdoor dining and seating areas. I think we should continue both yeah. because, mm -hmm. again, we, well. we are really still dealing with this COVID, and I think people feel more comfortable, and I think it's yeah. better for people not to be in confined areas. So do we want to extend them until the end of season? And if yeah. so, what is the date of the end of season? Right. Sounds good. May, may I ask uh, on this <laughs> area? <laughs> I knew you were going to say. She's uh, saying June, but June. May, is it Mother's Day? Is it Easter? When this, is, go right ahead. May I ask on this area? Um, is the city getting involved with the noise complaints? Um, I know of one in particular. I'm not 
again going to mention it. Um, it appears that the complainant, complainant resolved it themselves by having their own security resolve it, the issue, hmm. which means the city is kind of like allowing something, not necessarily having the ability to stop it. And it might have something to do with our noise ordinance that we are going to be working on very uh, shortly. Wow. So without saying the business, let me provide a point of clarity. Okay. Anybody who has a temporary outdoor use, like the image of the one at 3rd and 3rd, is not allowed to have a stage outside or, or music playing, out, you know, live music outside. So if it's that, that's something that was approved through the SPRAB process? It was not that. Okay. I'm we'll talk. <laughs> okay. We'll talk. It just bothers me that our citizens are being imposed upon by our decisions and we're just kind of not able to do anything about the situation we are allowing to be created. So I don't know that the city is on top of everything. I don't know that we know about the complaints. Sometimes they don't wait for us because we might be a little slow. So I'd just like to have all of those um, at least in your sight and not to wait until they must go out and spend money to get the situation resolved, excluding the city, because they throw their hands up. They know we're not going to do anything, so they just resolve it themselves. Okay, so we'll talk about whichever know that one some it is. Are out we there, can that's revoke all. them if there's a problem. These are easily revoked. Okay. We, I'm not aware of any problems with those that are... I'll, I'll, I'll share it yet. with you. I'll share it with you. All right, so you have that for the okay. four and five. What else did you need? Um, I think what was the really, date of the extension really, on that? Yeah, you know, the date right. at the um, end of season. We were season. talking about the end of season. What is that, though? I think people have different understandings. Oh, yes. I would say May 1st. Is it? May 1st. May 1st? Yeah. All right, so for May now, first, May 2022. Yes. Everyone's okay? Okay. Used to be Mother's Day, then it was Easter. Okay. May 1st, 2022 is one week before Mother's Day, so that falls on a Sunday. Oh, perfect. Okay. We'll revisit it prior to that then, depending on our situation. And then um, the activate the storefront activation, the graphics, the DDA has been in, in there's, to, we haven't seen, I think, a lot of it implemented, yeah. but if there was an opportunity, we wanted to be able to, it's to a great maybe program. still use yeah, that. May I ask one question? We have several events between now and then that are mm -hmm. the Christmas tree lighting. You mentioned something about Halloween. I know the... And thank you, Laura, for all of your hard work. And Anthea, you really tried to advocate. I didn't know you had such a big uh, group meeting and trying to resolve things. So congratulations and all of that. Uh, you've done it quite quietly and persuasively to, to help them. And I'm sure they're appreciative of it. Uh, or or you, are we working with the city manager when it comes to each event so it's not going to come back to us? Is this going to be on a month-by-month Yes. If I may, Madam Mayor and Commissioners, that would be appropriate on a case-by-case -case basis given the consensus you've offered working with the Downtown Development Authority, everyone else involved in this particular events, and that department directors will work with all involved collaboratively so that we can monitor accordingly. In any event of any challenges that may be unforeseen that are experienced, we'll come back and offer updates and recommendations and we'll go from there. Otherwise, I would love to have the opportunity to offer leadership and guidance as outlined. Very good. Because some of those events I'm not even aware of, like the craft show this weekend, I wasn't aware of it. So it's, there are things going on all the time and I'm just concerned. Yes, ma'am. And an additional caveat with that, ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask Downtown Development Authority, all other agents involved and keeping the commission informed relative to events and activities. We need to do the absolute best job we can in that regard, especially in light of the consensus having just been offered relative to COVID-19 yes. temporary guidance. So if we can all work together collaboratively in that regard, during Wednesday morning's executive leadership team meeting, as we debrief from this commission meeting outcome, we'll be able to offer some empowerment to that effect as well. So I do know of three, three menorah, tree lighting, and the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Yes, ma'am. And actually, we had a discussion not too long ago about the St. Patrick's Day Parade and some of the associated logistics therein. So, yes, ma'am. Thank you.
welcome. Yep. Right. Anything else? I just wanted to thank you uh, just to uh, just follow up on that cop comment. We have a special events advisory committee that actually meets and reviews biweekly and through the Parks and Recreation team. Um, it's called CTAC that does all the permitting of the events. And there's quite a few events that have come through all the way through the Delray Affair um, in April. So we're happy to share, um, and, and Sam's team, I'm speaking on his behalf, but we have a calendar that we've put together that we're happy to share with everybody. So thank you. Thank you guys. I think you got your answers, yes? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, love it. All right, so moving on to um, 7F. <clears throat> Are you looking for nominations? Oh, sorry. Okay. Good evening again, commissioners. This is uh, Duncan Tavares, Assistant City Manager. Back in July, you authorized an ILA with the DDA and the Chamber for sort of a tourism focus. And we are back before you tonight requesting uh, one of the members of the commission to be part of a sort of task force, if you will, as we develop a tourism strategic plan for the city. Fantastic. One of us was just listing all the places he's been traveling. <laughs> I'd like to, sorry, I'll go. I'd, I'd like to nominate uh, Commissioner Cassell. Yeah. Do you want to be on that? I think he was talking about Adam. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Sorry. I would. Li I'd be honored. Thank you, Miss Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take long. I just know that. Uh, I think we, ha I think I we just have know our, that uh, Deputy Vice Mayor's um, calendar is always full, I, and I he's appreciative of not being asked to do. You know what, all right, we got a, a, a motion and a second. Thank you all. And she's accepting it, so call the roll, please. Mr. Boston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Thank yes. you, talk to all you right, soon, thank Commissioner. You. Yes, thank all you. All right, moving on to the public hearings and second readings, we have resolution number 139-21. Resolution of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, certifying to the property appraiser and tax collector of Palm Beach County the rates of millage to be levied by the City of Delray Beach for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2021. Establishing the City of Delray Beach's general fund operating millage at 6.6611, which contributes to an aggregate millage rate for the City of Delray Beach that is 3.59% higher than the aggregate rolled back millage rate of 6.5309. Establishing the City of Delray Beach's debt service millage rate at 0.1792, providing for an effective date and further purposes. The intent of the City Commission is to adopt an operating millage rate of 6.6611, which is necessary to fund salaries, operating expenses, capital expenses in the general fund, and to adopt a debt service millage of 0.1792 for a total millage rate for fiscal year 2021-2022 of 6.8403. Thank you. Mr. Leggy. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Jellen. Uh, John Leggy, Finance Director. Tonight is the uh, first public hearing to adopt the fiscal year 22 budget. Uh, the second public hearing will be on September the 23rd, and that will be the final adoption of the millage rate for the general fund, the debt service millage, the DDA millage, and also the budget. Uh, at the uh, August 24th meeting, we gave you an in-depth uh, view of the budget. I do have a very, very, very short presentation, very short. Okay. And, the, and the focus on that is there are, were a couple of changes from the August 24th meeting that I'd like to present and, and, and provide to you. Uh, nothing really changed the strategy of balancing the general fund budget, but in all transparency, I wanted to bring those forward because they were based on the commission's direction and some other things we looked at as we were finalizing the budget. As you can see, it, uh, the uh, millage doesn't change. We're still looking, as, as Ms. Jellen stated, of a general fund millage of uh, 6.6611, a debt service millage of 0.1792 for an overall millage of 6.8403. This is the uh, budget you saw at the August 24th um, workshop. As you can see, the budget was uh, increased by about 8.74% from the previous year for a total budget of $250,523,927. After the changes from the, the workshop, the budget now is at 251, 265, 215 for an increase of, of 9.06. That's an increase of about 741,000 and I'll explain to you how we got there. In the general fund, the budget increased 118,000 on the expenditure side but also increased 118,000 on the, on the revenue side. So it was a net neutral uh, change. I'm not gonna go through each one, but you can see what, uh, what caused it. One of the things I would like to point out is the tree fund. 
we did take the two hundred thousand dollars that was in the general fund and we moved it to the uh, special the tree fund and the special projects fund at the commission's direction the uh, budget that now uh, stands at 147 for revenues, uh, 152 million for expenditures. It sustained 4.6 uh, million deficit that we showed you at the August 24th meeting. Again, staff's recommendation is to balance the budget using 4.6 million dollars from the ARPA funds, uh, use of no fund balance, and that'll uh, fund the gap. The ARPA funds receive a 5.4 million. The same slide you saw at the workshop with 4.6 going forward, use of the ARPA funds to, fund, to balance the budget, which will leave remaining ARPA funds of $873,660. The other funds changing, the special revenue funds changed by $200,000. Again, that's for moving the uh, tree, uh, tree planting from the general fund to the special revenue fund. As far as the enterprise fund, um, added $600,000 for the mausoleum. This wasn't a change. You saw this in the uh, CIP. Mm -hmm. It's just that we did not include it with the actual, in the actual cemetery fund as we were doing our fi final due diligence. We caught that error. The same thing with stormwater. That was reduced. I, I left the amount out. It was $136,000. Again, nothing changed in the CIP. It was just a matter of us doing our due diligence and making sure all the uh, funding was included in the stormwater utility fund. A debt service, uh, $125 for debt service interest, and that was the increase in the debt service funds. Therefore, uh, commissioners, uh, this will be the three resolutions as Ms. Jellins uh, spoke. Uh, the first one will be the general fund millage and also the debt service millage. I believe the DDA will be doing a presentation. The second resolution is for the DDA millage, and then the final presentation is for the actual uh, budget itself. A couple things I wanted to point out on the budget resolution uh, so that you're, you're aware. Uh, on September 30th, 2022, uh, the finance director, this is actually in, contained in the resolution that the finance director uh, is authorized to reserve unpaid purchase orders, outstanding contracts, and other commitments. This isn't a change. If we have a purchase order at the end of the year for services or goods that have not been received, we carry that purchase order over into the next fiscal year. And then it gets reappropriated in there so we can pay the bills because the uh, actual appropriations lapse at year end. The second one, uh, it might be a little bit different that you may have not seen this before, but it basically says certain unencumbered funds for grants and capital projects can be carried forward into the next year. And basically, our CIP, if we have a project, say it's a road project or it's a building project that's not completed at the end of the year, then those funds need to be appropriated into next year to finish the project. That's the end of my presentation. As I said, it would be short. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And Madam Mayor, if I may add, just for the record and clarity, Mr. Leggy's presentation covers items 8A, 8B, and 8C. Got it. Thank We're you going to take much. them each individually because each one right. requires a public hearing. Absolutely. So right. I believe the DDA is going to have a presentation. Right, so they'll come up next. But let me go ahead and just open up the floor at this point in time for anybody uh, in the public that would like to speak to 8A. Please step forward, state your name and address, and you will have three minutes. Seeing no one, public hearing is closed to the commission. Any questions for Mr. Leggy? Any concerns? I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, I, yes, ma'am. This really, thank you. <laughs> thank Sorry. you, Mayor. Um, this question is more for Mr. Moore than it is for Mr. Leggy. I'm sure you shared it with him. From the board meeting at the League of Cities, I said that there was an error found in the way that the reimbursements were being recalculated. Would you care to address it here, or is this not the spot? I will be br happy to briefly address it. It's not as applicable a concern. I did talk to Mr. Leggy about this Florida League of Cities in terms of their calculations in entitlement cities versus non-entitlement cities. You and I had a discussion about that back in August, and the city of Delray Beach is not at all impacted in that regard. The very day you and I, one day after you and I talked about this, I actually participated in my first Palm Beach County City, Palm Beach City County Management Association meeting. So the one fellow, Mr. Richard, you referred me to him and I. Mr. Ratcliffe. Mm -hmm. Richard, Richard Ratcliffe, thank you. He and I had an opportunity to meet in person and he did offer that clarity. So as we completed the preliminary proposed budget process, August 24th, August 25th time frame, that did not become as much of a concern. So I think we're pretty squared away in that regard. 
So therefore, I appreciate the opportunity for clarity because as soon as you brought it to my attention, we did have an opportunity to meet in person the following day. So thank you, ma'am. Very good. So no cigars. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Anyone else? If I can, I just want to bring my colleagues to one piece of it, just some attention because um, this is something that's important um, for your future. Um, when we make that decision as to the mill rate, we don't really have the opportunity again. I mean, here we sit once again. It's, it would be very, very, if you think about right now, changing that millage rate, think about how, how confusing and how difficult that would be for all the work that was put in. So when you make that decision, even though you get that response, you can, you can change it. This is the cap. It's not the cap. It is what it's going to be. And every year it does end up being this. So just I just want to bring that to your attention. because This is the point in time that we would make that change. And you can see how impossible that would be. It is. So just want to make sure everybody understands that. Recommendations are firm. Correct. You got it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank, thank you so you. much. Um, you need to uh, make a motion. Motion resolution. to approve resolution number 139-21. Second. All right, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? No. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. Okay. You're up. Not yet. Resolution 140 oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A resolution of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, certifying to the property appraiser and tax collector of Palm Beach County the rate of millage to be levied by the City of Delray Beach within the Downtown Development Authority Taxing District for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2021. Establishing the Downtown Development Authority Taxing District operating millage at 1.000, <coughs> which contributes to an aggregate millage rate for the City of Delray Beach that is 3.59% higher than the aggregate rolled back millage rate of 6.5309, providing an effective date and for other purposes. The, in the intent of the City Commission is to adopt an operating millage rate of 1.000, which is necessary to fund the cost of operation and maintenance for the Downtown Development Authority. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Peter Arts, and I live at 1746 Fern Forest Place here in Delray. And first of all, I want to thank our new city manager, Mr. Moore, for coming to our meeting today. And uh, we've seen you out and about everywhere. I don't know how you're getting it all done, but we appreciate that very much. I'm also here with Mavis Benson. She's the treasurer of the Downtown Development Authority, and I'm also here with Laura Simon. This is the first of two public hearings to approve the millage that was uh, discussed at the July meeting, and now I'd like to turn it over to Laura to have her tell you the truth about what we've been doing last year and what we're going to be doing this coming year. Okay. Laura? Good evening again, everyone, and um, very happy to be here. Laura Simon with the Downtown Development Authority, um, and thank you, uh, Chairman Arts and Mavis and our entire board and team. I do have our Downtown Activation Manager, Maris Gagato, here with us tonight. Uh, supporting the team and all of our efforts this year. She's been with us for a year or so. Um, I do have a presentation and I know um, time is precious, so and I'll just go ahead and get started. Oh, okay, great. So you all, we just discussed why we're here um, tonight to uh, review our millage rate um, is also that will fund our operation going forward into this fiscal year, um, 2021 and 2022. Our um, just for notice purposes, our, this year we are also just seeing a small percentage increase in the downtown DDA district, which runs from 95 to uh, A1A and four blocks on the north side, uh, three blocks on the south side of the commercial corridor, which encompasses both commercial and residential uh, DDA tax uh, properties. And we are only seeing a 0.05% increase this year. So. With that, it does equate to about $8,000 increase, which we'll share with you um, as we go through this presentation. But I did want to take some time just to um, brag a little bit. Oh, did I go back? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, and just share with you that we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year as an organization that was established in 1971. Uh, so we we're entering into the golden years, I like to say it. And it's been a great year to reflect and review all of the great work that this organization's done by the contributions of many, many people that walked before us. Uh, we did have a celebration on the uh, 21st of May that uh, recognized the uh, founder of our organization as well as uh, highlighted with our past board members and their contributions. 
Uh, we'll be looking forward to doing more happy history hours and uh, education, educating the uh, constituents throughout the coming months ahead. Um, but just highlighting the areas where we've invested and what we've done this year, um, as you all have been dealing with it, these past 18 months have been a tremendous um, burden and a challenge for all of us. Um, we are very, very lucky to have been able to move forward in the way we have um, staying on the ground in the trenches from the very beginning with our constituents of both the residents and our um, commercial property owners to just be in lockstep with the city and make sure that things are happening. Some highlights here, we did embark and stay focused tourism and marketing and marketing of the downtown has been our number one um, focus for many years, probably the past 50 years. And staying true to that, we uh, launched and stayed present, which helped us um, be successful in what we're doing here today. And also that the fact that we are as, uh, our businesses are as successful and our residents and new residents are coming here as, as much as possible. So we launched a new campaign. We moved forward with COVID events, COVID style events with our Fashion Week and Savor the Avenue, Halloween, Mother's Day, Restaurant Month, um, sidewalk sales, and our first Friday Art Walk that also um, was continuing virtually and in person as we rolled open. Um, I did want to share also just some highlights too as we uh, launched a new campaign and just give you a few. This We are also in, an, in our local agreement with the city and the chamber and partnership uh, as part of this campaign for the city and the DDA is leading that effort. This is an example of our new uh, getaway guide, find your fun and showcasing all the great things that uh, Delray Beach has to offer. Uh, we did update, we are have a billboard in the Fort Lauderdale Airport where we advertise uh, for our, our downtown and our city as a whole, as a place to be uh, both for fun and for all things um, wonderful in a safe way. So that is actually in the uh, Terminal 1 Airport at Fort Lauderdale. And these are just a few sample ads that we are running in right now digitally online. Um, tourism, I just was at the Visit Florida Tourism Conference, which Visit Florida is our state tourism bureau who has taught us and led us through this uh, pandemic in a big way, reinvesting million, millions of dollars into um, showcasing our state. And Delray Beach is a partner with them. Um, and the results are right now, we're showing a, over 2019, we're showing a 6% um, comparison, just a little bit over 2019 numbers, which is significant considering where we were um, at sometimes 0% occupancy in the middle of the pandemic in our hotels. So it is very important for us to stay present and the importance of marketing. And I you know, thank you for your partnership with us on this. Moving into our economic vitality, which is our economic development section of our area. This is uh, some high level things that we've done. We've welcomed close to 70 new businesses into downtown this and since probably October. And that is a significant increase of uh, retail, restaurants, services, all different sectors. And uh, some larger like the Dari Beach Market and the Ray Hotel to smaller, um, more one person, really independent businesses. We launched a, a legacy business program this year to recognize those businesses that are in our community that are 15 years or more. We have a significant number of them and they are part of the fabric that makes Delray a special place to be. So we are highlighting and recognizing them as well. And the storefront activation uh, project, this is something that Maruska has been um, extremely uh, essential on and working with this and the image up there is one of our graphics that's on Northwest Fifth Avenue. Um, another highlight in placemaking. So placemaking is in a way we make the, the place beautiful in partnership with the city, working with our uh, clean and safe unit who does a fantastic job. We are so blessed to have uh, such a, a great unit from the police department, the fire department to the code team, um, beautification team and partnership with them to just make sure that our uh, place is vibrant, beautiful and you know safe place to be. So. We are, um, we are responsible for the amenities, the downtown uh, decorative lighting program, as well as the holiday lighting program and the banner program. So we manage that to maintain it. We manage that and we invested in all new decorative lighting this year. So that is from 95 all the way to A1A and in Pineapple Grove, we have all the rope lighting and decorative lighting that makes us a great place all year round to be. Um, and it adds to that quality life experience. Our ambassador program is stronger than ever. 
and doing uh, fantastic work with our um, our police team just on a constant basis, 7, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. Right now we are, um, and I'll share that in a few minutes, but they've been out there on the front line from the nonstop um, with, with working with our homeless task force, our, our panhandling ordinance, to just really helping our transient population just stay healthy, get the services that they need, if they deserve, if they want them, if they choose to use them, and just making sure they have a bottle of water and a granola bar or something that they can get to um, to make sure that they're taken care of. And also the corner picture up on the left, on the left there is um, the observation mural. So the DDA is funding $10,000 towards that mural restoration, which is a um, huge mural that was on the side of the Delray mm -hmm. Camera Shop, which will be reinstalled on the Delray Camera Shop uh, once it's completed. It's being worked on at the Art Warehouse right now by Dana Donnelly. And um, that will be put up there for, our, for public view on 3rd, 4th Avenue, Northeast 4th Avenue. So again, uh, highlighting our, um, our year-end highlights, recognizing our board and all of the great work that we've done. And a lot of human resources go into the DDA and behind the scenes work. And we've done, we've got a, an awesome team that just is, has not stopped from, never stops. And they love and they're passionate about the city. And I'm really blessed to be working with them, so. So just on uh, why we're here tonight, obviously, mm -hmm. is to look at our numbers. So this is a, a view of 1920 uh, final view, our amended budget, which is our current fiscal operating bu budget, and then where we're going uh, next year. Um, you can see across the board there, there's not much uh, really big change um, in our revenue. We don't, on the sponsorship side, we do, um, request and work with our private sector for sponsorship on programs and events to help us do more co-op advertising different things that we do as we move into that but we don't um, budget for that until we as we we only add it as a revenue once we receive it so um, this year's numbers you'll see that when we report our final numbers our revenues for sponsorship was much higher than the 23,000 so it's, it's fantastic but and we appreciate that very much um, all numbers are kind of staying. We're running flat, even though we've decided to take more on um, this year, and um, we're looking forward to continuing to do that. We did add a grant uh, number in there, and I'll explain what that is, what that grant is going to be at $10,000 as we go forward. So going into this year, um, our board has met numerous times on workshops to get to this point with our team. Um, staying really consistent in our marketing efforts, highlighting some new things that we're going to be doing this year is obviously our tourism advertising. Um, continuing to be that communication and messaging resource for the, on behalf of the city. We are very customer facing. We have the downtown downtowndowrybeach.com site, which is also a visit downrybeachfl.com site. So we're driving all the traffic to that site right now. Um, and it has all things events, all things happening, anything you need to know. So downtowndowrybeach.com is where you need to be to find out all your event um, dates and calendars. Uh, also, as we go in here, and I know Duncan and I appreciate the Public Art Advisory Board's input on this, is that the um, Delray Art Trail, I'll hurry through this, sorry. So Delray Art Trail is a huge, um, undertaking that we've taken over and that is a website that houses all of the public art and private art that's in our city. We are also bringing out art bringing back an event called Art and Jazz on the Avenue and that is something that was um, a long-standing event for probably 30 years 25 to 30 years that will be coming back and moving that around the town so look for more of that to come so I'm going to speed through this because I know we're um, on a this is a lot of this is repeat because we are moving forward with the same initiatives and priorities. One big thing as we move into economic uh, vitality and working with uh, Sarah Maxfield, the economic development director, is really working on retention programs, um, collaborations with our West uh, West Atlantic commercial corridor, and all of our subdistricts to just could build, build that retention and build those committees so we know how to move forward and reengaging Bob Gibbs on the shopability study. Um, to bring him back to town to, uh, since with all of the new influx of new businesses and new residents, we really want to make sure that 
and new team members in the city. Make sure that um, Bob Gibbs gets be able to really share that message and vision for our, our community. Placemaking, we're investing more into our safety ambassador program this year, adding uh, additional nighttime patrols, extending their hours. So as our downtown expands and grows, and uh, it's well, it swells at night, is continuing to make sure that um, our coverage is out there. So we're gonna be extending their hours on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and also looking for uh, support and contributions from our private sector to help us um, make, continue to add uh, to that program. We're also looking at um, public art installations east of the bridge. Uh, we did hear that from our constituents that there is no public art east of um, the Intercoastal Waterway. So looking at potentially um, doing some mural projects up there. Uh, and one thing on this, uh, as far as placemaking, one thing that we continue to hear from our constituents is pedestrian signage on street, sidewalk. I mean, wayfinding is slow to come. I'm not sure where wayfinding will be and when it'll be on street, but that'll help navigate traffic and, and vehicle traffic. But pedestrian walkable traffic to see off-sites uh, to get off of Atlantic Avenue is real, or a little farther down the avenue is difficult. So we have put this on as a priority to look at how it look at signage and how we can update our downtown signage to get rid of the A-frame signs but still help people find their way. Um, last is our team and funding. That is, again, we've succession planning is a big thing for our organization, updating our strategic plan, uh, continuing to invest in our talent and our operation. A lot of the program, every, all the programs and events we do is all human resource and that's our team. So it is um, funded through this, this area of our budget. So our art and activation grant, so this isn't a new grant for us that will help us um, take a $10,000 funding line item and be able to restore and add some um, new art into our downtown. <coughs> So as we said, and Duncan mentioned this, we are working with a property owner and working with an artist to help restore the uh, dancing pineapples on 2nd Avenue and Atlantic Avenue. So, so with that, I have um, listed our numbers up here and I'll leave it at this slide, but I truly appreciate all your support over these past year, especially this past 18 months, more so, and the team's efforts. I, we could not do this. We are in lockstep with the city and we are a we're here, please maximize our value. Thank you for including us in your goal setting workshop and I hope that our board and you, and you all can work <coughs> together as we go down and maybe future workshops together as we move forward into this year um, and with the new teams, so thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, this is a public hearing, so if there's anybody in the uh, public that would, or in the, in the chamber here that would like to come up and speak, you can do that now by stating your name and address and you'll have three minutes. Seeing no one, public hearing is closed to the commission. Any questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, moving on to 8C, which we've gone through. Mr. Leggy, this is resolution number. 141-21. A resolution of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, approving a budget and making appropriations of sums of money for all expenditures of the City of Delray Beach for the fiscal year beginning on October 1st, 2021, and ending on September 30th, 2022, prescribing the terms, conditions, and provisions with respect to the items of appropriations and their payment, providing for supplemental appropriations and reappropriations, providing for severability of parts hereof if declared invalid, providing an effective date and for other purposes, that's it. Okay, so if there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to resolution number 141-21, please step forward. Again, no one, so public hearing is closed. Uh, if there's no other questions or concerns, entertain a uh, motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? No. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Okay, 
And we are now at ordinance number 30-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, adopting a comprehensive plan amendment pursuant to provisions of the Community Planning Act, Florida Statute Section 163.3177 and Section 163.3184, as more particularly described in Exhibit A, entitled Always Delray Comprehensive Plan Amendment, ordinance number 30-21 and incorporated herein by reference to bring the adopted comprehensive plan into compliance with legislative changes to Florida Statute 163.31776I1 by adopting a property rights element, providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. And this is first reading. Okay. So we don't have a presentation on first reads? Correct. And uh, so entertain a motion to? Motion to approve. Mm -hmm. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Oh, she stepped out. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. All right. Moving on to um, agenda item nine, first readings, ordinance number 33-21. In ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 34, Elections of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, by amending Section 34.16, Filing of Nominating Petition to amend the qualifying period for the City of Delray Beach's general election, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. This one's also first reading, and it was based on, I, I think it was a workshop item we were, or a discussion mm -hmm. item we recently had. Can I ask if I made the right decision on 8D? Did I ask for public comments? Which one? I think you did. 8D. You know what? You're right. And I was actually just pulling that up too. So if we can just um, just if we can just reopen 8D um, and just open it up. For okay, I'm going to reopen 8D ordinance number 30-21 for public comments. If there's any public comment. Please step forward, state your name, address, and you'll have three minutes. Seeing none, public comments is closed. Are we okay to just move forward, or do we need to have another? Um, let's just do another vote. Motion to approve ordinance number 30-21. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. That was quick. Okay, and so... <sighs> You had to go backwards. I, I mistakenly Sorry. didn't have public comment, so I had to go back. Okay, so we're on 9A. We've got that into the record. Yes, it is a first um, reading again, so there will be no uh, presentation. Entertain a motion. Motion to approve ordinance number 33 21. Second. Hey, okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. All right. We are closing down the meeting here shortly. Comments and inquiries on non-agenda item, Mr. City Manager. I have none at this time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Wow. That's great. City Attorney. Wish I could say that. So yeah. I have two. <laughs> oh, minor, minor quick. Um, the first one is our outside counsel for our opioid litigation contacted me. There is um, another one of the defendants in the many actions um, with regard to these issues. Another one of the defendants is called Malincrod, M-A-L-L-I-N-C-K-R-O-D-T. Um, they are a significant generic drug manufacturer um, who has also declared bankruptcy. Um, the settlement would be $1.6 billion in cash, which obviously, as you know, would be mm -hmm. a lot of different plaintiffs. So um, it's not a significant amount, even though it sounds like it's a lot of money. But I just need to get a motion um, to approve uh, moving forward with um, that type of a settlement. Anybody wants to jump in? Motion to approve. Thank you. Direct. Motion to approve is fine. Call the roll, please. Someone second. Yes. Sorry. The quiet voice. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Second thing, um, in the matter of uh, this Foster Marine versus City of Delray Beach, this is the bike lane case, um, I would like to have another shade meeting on this matter. Um, I was looking at um, either September 27th, 28th, or 29th. Um, our outside counsel is available that day. I know that you have a CRA meeting on, I believe it's the 28th. 
So I don't know if you want to do it before that, even though I know that's at the arts warehouse. So, um, you know, we've done that before. Be or fine. we can do it on any other of those days if that's if you're amenable. Yeah, Monday's not good for me, but Tuesday before that meeting is fine. Yeah, that works for me as well. Me too. Okay. It should be quick, so we can probably, um, do you want to do 3 o'clock? No. Okay, so I'm requesting a shade meeting in the matter of Foster Marine versus the City of Delray Beach, case number 50-2017-CA8953. Um, the shade meeting would be held in the commission chambers, it would start in the chambers, on um, September 28th at 3 o'clock. Present would be Mayor Shelley Petrolia, um, Vice Mayor Shirley Johnson, Deputy Vice Mayor Adam Frankel, Commissioner Ryan Boylson, Commissioner Julie Cassell, City Manager Terrence Moore, myself, Lynn Jellen, our outside counsel, which is Eric McAlilly and Sanaz Alampour, and a certified court reporter. Um, it would be to discuss um, trial strategy, case strategy, as well as a proposal for settlement that was made by the plaintiff. So if we could just get a motion. May I, I just that state that perhaps there was a workshop maybe planned that hasn't been discussed, I don't know, for the CRA, and we usually do it at two o'clock, so I don't oh. know if that might be a conflict would you like to do one o'clock? Want to do one o'clock? That's fine. Yeah. Yes. Okay. One o'clock, and I, I anticipate it won't last more than an hour. Oh, I need a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. That's it. All right. Very good. To the commission. <clears throat> Anyone? Yes. You can I'll start. start. Sure. Um, super quick. Periwinkle, the store downtown, is celebrating its anniversary. Uh, there is a, um, uh, oh, it's Sip and sip and Shop on the 16th, this uh, Thursday, from 5 to 8, and portion of the proceeds from the sales will go to the uh, Delray Beach Historical Society. So I suggest we all go there and shop. Um, <laughs> second, this is something I brought up before, uh, Program, you know, regarding all the cats that we have running around the city, the feral cats. It's a uh, trap, spay, neuter program. And uh, what I'm going to say is this statistically, because I did this all before, so I'll keep it brief. One cat, male or female, that is not spay or neutered will produce offspring to, of about 2,000 in four years. It's astronomical. And believe me, these cats out there, they're so sickly. And all we have to do is um, subcontract with someone who will trap. My understanding is it could range from twenty-five to thirty-five thousand a year. Um, Peggy Adams does the spay and neutering. They vaccinate and then you release. And so, ultimately, what you do is slow down the population. You still keep them on the street. People will still continue to feed them. And didn't, didn't we agree to this? No, I don't think we actually agreed. You and Miss, uh, I think you said yes, and I was promoting it, but I didn't get a third. I thought we did. I think it was to get more in, more information for city staff to bring it forward. So can we ask it was city such staff? It's such a small amount of money. I it's thought, such yeah, a small amount of money, and it will really. I I can't. I told you. I I, I took these cats to two different hospitals. They were. It was devastating the shape they were in because they they keep on reproducing, and there's not enough people feeding them, and they're getting you know all kinds of diseases. But it's also not good for us, ultimately. Oh, I agree. Uh, may I just say it wasn't uh, our current city manager, so let's give him an opportunity and Ms. Jellen to come back, and I don't see why it can't okay. happen. thank you. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And then, oh, the last thing I would like to do is show everybody this lovely T-shirt mm -hmm. made by our very own Gina right here, and it says, Lights Out, Turtles Dig the Dark. Apparently, this is part of our beach bucket program. We developed um, buckets that are going to be about cleaning uh, plastic. As you remember, I asked mm -hmm. for a consensus on that. And these are going to do the same thing, but they're to um, recognize that some of our turtles are suffering from uh, light disorientation. And so uh, we have an event on Saturday morning. I believe it's 7 a.m., is that correct? Okay, I'll get there early then. <laughs> thank you very much for this. And Missy as well, she's not here, but thank you, Missy, for your hard work on this and the Beach Bucket Program. I all got one. May I ask Commissioner Cassell, every year we talk about the turtles not going in the right direction, that's back out into the ocean. We're doing everything. Why, what's not happening? Well, I, I, don't, I can't speculate about that. We'd I have don't to talk know. to the turtle people. They probably know. But... 
I think there's a certain percentage that are disoriented naturally, but for the most part, it's light. Because we're talking it's about it's, I, it's it's the you know they complain about the lighting and they complain about this yeah. and complain about that, but yet and still you're saying the turtles are still heading to a one a. Sadly, the turtles are disoriented. So anyway, we can bring a little uh, recognition to the problem, and maybe uh, some of the local residents will dim their lights. I don't know. I'm hoping it's effective. Yeah, we good. Thank you. Right. you. Finished? Yes, thank you. Deputy Vice Mayor, you're up. I'm going to use my time to congratulate uh, Mr. Craig Menon, Evan with the Menon Group, and Click Hospitality for an amazing uh, hotel opening. Uh, the Ray is spectacular. It's just uh, uh, such a great gem in Pineapple Grove and brings some of the activity off of Atlantic Avenue. And I know uh, both Menon Group and Click, uh, who runs the restaurants there, they're actively seeking all kinds of employment. So if you know any young people that needs a job now that the unemployment benefits are kind of disappearing, it'd be a good place to work. But congratulations to all of them. It was great uh, uh, to have everyone, uh, see everyone there, and they just spectacular. <clears throat> it really was. Yes, um, no, I was just gonna, I was gonna point out, because it really clicked for me um, this past weekend, just all the amazing sports programs that we have in uh, in Delray, and from the Atlantic High Games, uh, which we have some, a big one coming up with the homecoming, to the boxing match um, this past Friday night. I'm sure that's not going to be the last. Um, the Rocks and the and, and the Bulldogs, uh, the big event against Boynton a few weeks ago. Um, we have AC Delray tra traveling all over the nation, and a new lacrosse academy, and of course our award for the tennis facility. And I just think it's worth pointing out that we have a lot for a little town. We got a lot going on in both uh, youth and adult adult sports. And you don't have to play it to uh, be a spectator, so. Perfect, anything else? That's it, Vice Mayor? Yes, <clears throat> I'm not gonna say too much this time. Um, there is a lot going on in Delray. We can't do everything. I just like to bring in something from the western part of the city. I was blessed to substitute for the mayor in the ribbon cutting at the mobile 7-Eleven station at the corner, the southeast corner of uh, Linton and Military. And the entrepreneur who is a franchisee is 30 years old with Bangladesh heritage. It's amazing, and I got to meet some of the um, executives from the 7-Eleven Corporation, and I think that they're an up-and-coming. I used to know a little 7-Eleven when, when I was younger, much younger, growing up in Delray Beach, and I had thought they had gone away like the dodo bird, but uh, they are rising up again, and stock, whatever. Uh, there's a great opportunity, and I look forward to working with them and bringing other opportunities, not necessarily a franchisee-type opportunity, but maybe a program that's going to start at the grade school level to encourage our students that you don't necessarily have to go to college. It would help if you have it, but if you have the get up and go about it, you could also be a an owner of a 7-Eleven store near you. So look forward to doing that. Thank that's you. It, that's it. All right. Very that's good. Cool. And I just wanted to also um, uh, piggyback off of my colleague about uh, what a great opening uh, the Menon team had. And, and it was really just flawless. I, I don't know how they did it, to tell you the truth, because it was so much going on. And for them to have gotten ready at that point in time and to host as many um, people there that day, that was really kind of the opening day. Uh, and, and it seemed like it just went with, on without a stitch. Um, I also wanted to mention that the artwork in there is just phenomenal, and uh, I hope that that's part of that art walk because uh, I just was I was amazed at, um, especially when you walk right in and they have that whatever it is you look into, the endless whatever. Um, that's one heck. I think it's only one of one of two, and th neither of them are exactly the same in the in, the, in maybe the world. Uh, it, it, certainly the United States. So that was that was pretty amazing. Um, I also wanted to just mention to my colleagues and to find out what your feelings are. I've received a couple of people who are concerned because of the elevation in COVID, again, of meeting, the wanting to Zoom. I, you know, I talked with the city attorney and it's very difficult, I guess, for our city to Zoom 
more than one person. It's kind of like you can do one, but if you do more than one, then you need to do 100%. And um, yeah, it's just there are certain people, and it's not even people who are not vaccinated. There's actually vaccinated people that have just concerns about you know the regrouping together. Um, I, I feel from my perspective, I feel comfortable, but I'm not sure how everybody else does it. Certainly people who go home and they have somebody that's older that is more susceptible or whatever, they're just concerned. And I'm reaching out to you guys because these are our, these are our volunteers that are doing this. So my thoughts were, I wanted to ask the, my colleagues to allow the, their own boards to make that determination if they want to all or nothing kind of like a Zoom or not, um, depending. I know that it's difficult, but it, it just, I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I mean, I really am, and I was hoping that in the event that, or if one needed to or whatever, as long as it's just one, because I think that that's the issue. We can do it if it's one, but we can't they, do it if it's how more. How will they accommodate the public comment and the like the same way? Well, I mean, the, I think that everything can go on as it is. The city can continue as, as they are, I guess. I don't know. I'm just, it, maybe, it's, maybe I'm making it too simple. I just feel as though we should have some sort of an option for those that are feeling uncomfortable if there's a possibility to do it. I, I, I know it's very taxing on our IT department. No. And so I know when we spoke, you know, we can't do the hybrid model. It's really right. all or nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it does require a lot from staff. They have to redo all the agendas. They have to redo the notices. They have to open up the public comment phone lines and things like that. And really, City Hall is not closed to the public. So, yeah. you know, I... I don't know. I mean, listen, I'm just trying to like, I know that I've received a couple of calls of people that are concerned because of the fact that it's, it's breaking out again. And you, I, you know, I we don't... have the attendance policy. You can say, yeah. that, you know, it's out you can try to relax it so long as there's a quorum or things like that. Could I ask a question? Maybe we could accommodate because I think the issue for me would be the call in line. It might get confusing. People wouldn't know, do I have to call this meeting? Do I have to go to this meeting? I, I, I don't know that we should do that, but could we set up the temperature? Uh, the temperatures in the hallway and take people's temperature when they come in and do the questions would that do you think that I don't know I think it was people? just personal so I don't know if that would make a difference for the people that are here so anyway I just brought it up because mm -hmm. I was thinking that if they if it wasn't difficult to do an all or nothing or whatever considering mm -hmm. those numbers that we had this weekend coming out in the paper I, I would leave it to them to decide like we would decide for ourselves but if it's just almost impossible for, you know, the city to be able to set that up separately and not all, all, you know, boards, then we can't do it. You know, we can't accommodate. Okay. May, may I think I? we need to be consistent. And I, I would say. Yes. I I add to that. Wait, I'm sorry. I, one moment. I feel like just for the safety of everybody in the building, we should be taking temperatures when people come in as a general protocol. Well, they're wearing masks. I mean, is that, do you think that that would, do we have that machine still? Yeah. We have the, we have the, um, we have the temperature, mm -hmm. the thermometers basically, the body thermometers that's machine. available, and a stand-up machine that we can ask people to position their faces accordingly. So, right. if it will help, we can make arrangements for that to be positioned for respective meetings, mm -hmm. and in terms of staff allocation of resources to address the concerns, that's probably the most appropriate, efficient step we can probably take. So I will work with our rescue information mm -hmm. technology staff to make arrangements if that will help. And I think I'd like to give that an opportunity administratively because we actually have this device positioned in different workstations of the city of Delray Beach. I had an opportunity to visit with public works crews last week. And I myself participate in an exercise in a structure pretty reasonably and efficiently. So I would suggest that we give that an opportunity for the next meeting, and hopefully that will alleviate some concerns. Okay. Um, I was just going to add my well, two cents worth. It is very difficult, even under these circumstances, to hear our meetings. I don't know if YouTube is the best. It is almost impossible to participate so it's technologically we're not ready we're not able we're limited as to how many people can even sit up here mm -hmm. and our number is seven and I don't know some of the boards have more than seven people so it's it's hard mm -hmm. already 
anyway, it was just a, a thought because I've received some concerns, and I know that they're they're valid, especially with the with the you know newspaper articles. And it's it's odd to me that you know we don't have the capability. It just seems like it would be so simple. Let me explain. I sit at the TPA meeting. I can move anybody in or out. I can be on you know uh, you know video or not. Um, the rest of the, the group is there. I'm not. I'm on video. So I don't know why it's so difficult for us. It's like an all or nothing, and it's so difficult. It just seems so antiquated. Yes, sir. Well, to that point, sorry, to that point, you know, I had three hearings in the Palm Beach County Court this morning. And they figured it out there. I, I don't know what they do or whatever, but it was a lot better being in my office this morning instead of driving in the rain. And they figured out a system to accommodate people, so yeah. I, you would think the technology's there. Right, well, know. I'm sure it is, but we just don't maybe have it. It just would seem like, you know, in these types of situations, if, if, if we have a volunteer that is older, doesn't want to be in, you know, in the mix, but, you know, there are some boards that barely make a quorum, and, and, and some that require a super majority to be there, like I think our yeah. uh, BOA, and if they don't have those numbers, they're they're messed up, and, and and it puts things off further and further. And that's why I'm saying it, we should have that flex. It would feel like just especially in these in these times, it's very difficult for me to understand how we don't with with the kind of money that we spend in IT. But um, listen, I, I'm just I brought it up. I said what I said, and that's it. Anyway. Otherwise, I'll proceed with the temperature devices. Okay, sounds great. Well, at least do that. That'll be a minimum at a minimum. So I thank you all so much for the meeting, and um, you all have a, a safe and uh, happy week. Talk right. to you soon. Good night.